Jazz hands. The jazz hands. Yep, we are live. Welcome back to the Big Daddy Gun Studios. I'm Hank Strange. We're live. Put your big girl panties on. We got VSO Vigilant Specter Operations. Is that is that what you're breaking up a little bit? Yeah. Is it is it Vigilant Specter Operations? No, it was that for a while, and then Uh we we rebranded it. Um, We had been so when we started YouTube. Um, we started YouTube before it was ever like a real big thing and, you know, guys can make money on it and it became a serious thing. So we all used, um, and I think military arms channel did this too. Um, we all had usernames, right. That we used to just upload, you know, stuff. We did that, you know, MySpace, you know, all of that sort of mold was how everything was built back then. And we have since, um, Changed the uh, the branding on the channel from all that kind of like juvenile stuff that we used to do. <laughs> to uh, <laughs> was to, that from like forums? Was that your name on the forums or something? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's literally what it was. It was um, was from the forums. You know. Um, wow, you've been how, doing this so long. You were back. You were back in the forum days. Yeah, and it's funny because I don't. I don't actually. Um, participate on any forums at all anymore. Yeah, but, um, but that makes you OG, dude. <laughs> yeah, like um, this is this was like back before YouTube was like a, a you know, a big deal, right? So, mm-hmm. um, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, nobody and anybody who tells you that they knew what YouTube was going to become um, as it is today is full of crap. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, we were just jacking around at the time we started the channel, basically looking around saying, um, you know, we can do just as good content as these guys that were doing it at the time because there wasn't a whole lot of good stuff out there at the time. And uh, and we so we started doing it. And then we came back a few years later and we're like, wow, people are actually watching this crap on purpose. You know, yeah. maybe we're going to try a little bit harder, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, then we went underwent a rebranding. So um, Okay. So what does VSO stand for now? Actually, we we turned it into even more of a joke, and it is very shitty operators. <laughs> that's what I we. Like that. uh, yeah, Wait, no joke. T shirts. No, I need him. I need him. Damn I, it, uh, dude! I actually okay, fine. That's that's the next one I'll make. Right? We were doing uh, shirts with a guy, a uh, local, um, uh, a combat injured veteran that okay. was doing our shirts, and then he we kind of had a falling out with a guy because he wasn't he was having other problems with this business and he expected us to front load, you know, a whole bunch of stuff um, okay. for him. And, you know, it just wasn't working out. So we actually just kind of let the whole apparel thing kind of fall by the wayside. Um, okay. I'd like to restart it. I just, you know, I'm a busy guy. If haven't you don't, to it. Okay. So if you don't have a shirt guy, I actually have a shirt guy. And I'm going to be coming out with shirts. I don't know, probably in a couple of weeks, mm. but I have a shirt guy. So, Cool. We are going to come out with uh, T-shirts and stuff like that, and then these guys make them for people. So people order them, they make them, they ship them. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's cool. So I can link you up with that dude. That could be. You know? That could definitely be worth my time because um, my biggest problem is time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't have. To, <laughs> I just did uh, our latest giveaway through our Patreon, and it's it took me like two days, mm-hmm. right? Like <laughs> to get all the packages out. I couldn't. I can't do it that big again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, yeah. I can't do it. Yeah, yeah, that's not the kind of thing I could do. Now I know I can hear the like people are asking me in the chat if the if we got hit by the thunderstorm yet. No, it's it's I think above us right now because <laughs> I can hear it rumbling and grumbling and everything. But I think so far the internet and everything looks good. So let's let's like start and be official on this. I want to thank everyone that's um, in the chat. Got a bunch of folks in the chat. We've got people watching and all that kind of stuff. I want to invite everyone watching to share. Click the like button right now. Click the like button. Share this video. Make sure you're subscribed to the Hank Strange situation. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. YouTube's been doing that. We're going to talk a little bit about YouTube and what it's been doing to attack your local gunfighters. So we're going to, you know, we, I just want to remind everyone though, click like. Definitely share on your social media with friends and family and make sure you're subscribed to us as well as the VSO gun channel. I did put a link in the description of this video. Um, Hit us up with all your questions, comments, things you guys want to talk about, stuff in the news that you may want to talk about. Um, You know, first what I'm going to do is have Curtis, 
that's that's the real name, right? We can reveal. Yep. Can we? Can, okay, we can give yep. up the real we can, name. We can give, I run by my real name now, so oh, it's do. it's all good. Yeah. Okay. Um, some of the other guys keep theirs. Um, like uh, my brother's still uh, Bacon is still in in the uh, military, so he keeps his. Okay. You know, and some of the other guys, you know, have high powered jobs, so they keep theirs. You know, it is whatever. Um, but ever since you know I started like doing this full time, I pretty much you know started just going by my real name. It's yeah. It it's more real, you know. Yeah. I feel so. you. I mean, I, that, Hank Strange is not my real name, but I still use it because people have been calling me Hank Strange for a long time, <laughs> even before I've done this. Back in like my my like underground hip hop days, I was like a producer. I was like a underground P Diddy. I was like H Diddy. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, so I've been doing it for a long time. <laughs> Plus, you know, um, just to to uh, not get Lola and the kids into a bunch of stuff. One of my kids graduated and he's in college now, so the other one's still in high school. So, but but pretty much Hank Strange. I don't even recognize when people call me by my real name. You know, only Lola calls me Sean. That's my real name. So, and only Lola I, calls I, me. I, I feel privileged because <laughs> in my cell phone, I uh -huh. have Hank's real name. So there you go. <laughs> Congratulations. Cool. Yeah. People <laughs> always want to, like, if people find out my real name, then they want to call me that. And then I don't respond to that. And they're like, what's, what's, the, what's the matter with you? Because <laughs> I just don't hate it. It's like, you know, there's so many people. So I, I people have called me Hank for a long time, and I kind of, you know, I'm cool with it. It's a lot cooler than my, than my, you know, my real name. So there's no, like, super <laughs> secret underground, super operator stuff going on. I'm pretty much like, like, I'm going to get one of those very shitty operator T-shirts when you make them. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you keep me posted on that. So <laughs> I will. I, I will. I need to. I, I'll canvas some people to get some designs made for me, so that I don't have to. You yeah. Know, put any like zero effort into it. There you go. No, these guys. These guys that I'm going to hook you up with, they can do all that stuff. So cool. All you got to do is put the t-shirts out there. So you know, let's let Lola's not here. She left a bunch of notes for me though. I've been running around all day, and Lola was off today. So whenever Lola is off. It's like basically my nightmare. Mm. I have to get up early. I have to do a bunch of chores and run around and follow orders all damn day. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Our power actually went out last night, so we were up oh. to like three in the morning waiting for it to come on, trying to manage various things. And and uh, my girl, she was she was kind of sick last night at the same time, so it's kind of like uh, she just walked in. She actually brought me that drink that I've been sipping on. So oh, cool. Uh, yeah, cool. So what's up to her? So it's you. You've got the same girlfriend from the last time, right? Um, we're right. actually getting married. So oh, congratulations. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Because so. I, I mean, I think I remember. I've known you for a long time. I think as long yeah. as I've been doing this, I've known you. You're like one of my first buddies. In this whole thing, and amazingly, we're still friends. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the hell happened. <laughs> well, you know, hey, what can I say? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I don't get. Well, there's a lot of, and a lot of people don't realize this. We were kind of talking sort of about this before uh, we got on live. Um, there's a lot of politics in the uh, in the in clicks in the gun industry, and uh, yeah. while I do fall into several of them, um, I try to be as non-political as I can. Because you never know when um, you're gonna need to collaborate with somebody, and if you've been, I, I'm just not a shit talker. Uh, yeah. That's just the way I just kind of roll. You know, people talk yeah. shit about me, but you know, typically I'm not the shit talker because um, I don't want that to come back later if I've been talking shit on somebody and <laughs> be like, oh hey, now guess what? We're stuck on this project together, and now we yeah. have to get along, right? This is good, yeah, that's gonna be fun. You know yeah. what? I think there's a couple of things. Like one thing I like about you, you really don't give a fuck what anyone thinks. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, that's what I like about your channel, all that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, shout out to Meredith's Mayhem. He just like donated twenty bucks to the chat. He wants to know, Hank, do you have any music beats you could let me use for my channel? Okay, uh, we have to talk about that. When Lola comes back in, I will tell her to um, like private message you or something like that and get your thing and sure I can you know I've always got stuff that I'm that I'm making because I like making music that's my that's how I get high from being creative so I don't mind if you use if you use things that I have right now or you know some other things that I've like been messing around with or maybe I'll make some stuff for you so 
Thanks a lot for that. We appreciate it. Yeah. So what I was saying is like you don't, you don't really give a shit what anyone thinks. You do what you want to do. Yeah, pretty much. Yep. Yeah. And you roll how you want to roll. I don't know if you would say like zero fucks. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. But, yeah. but close. <laughs> pretty close. Pretty close. Yeah. You know, there are, yeah, there are, there are things that I that I definitely do care about, but um for the you know, for the most part, um I don't owe a whole lot of people a whole lot of things. So Yeah. Um Yeah. So yeah. and and I think that comes off a lot in our content. Uh, that, um, you know, we're really there to, um, you know, I started this just messing around, but, you know, at some point it became real for me because people actually put stock into what I say. So um, when I am evaluating a gun uh, for the purposes of putting it on YouTube, make sure that it's right. Right. And that, you know, what you see is what you get. I, mm -hmm. um, I think Mr. Guns and Gears said this once too. I don't reshoot groups. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, you mean uh, like make it look like you're awesome shooter? <laughs> yeah. No, no, I totally suck. Right. Yeah. I actually shoot a handgun, better shoot a rifle. Um, but <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, that's the thing. That's what, you know, listen, I think it's a good thing to be real with people. And, and also, you know, people shouldn't believe that this stuff is all like special, you know, and you have to be a super operator or something like that to, uh, you know, to do this. So I'm getting, I'm getting a bunch of questions here. Let me, let's, uh, let's stick to the, uh, let's stick to the program here. Okay. And um, let's follow some of the instructions because Lola has left instructions for me and questions. So first she wants you to like introduce yourself to the audience Tell them, you know, who you are and how you started doing a YouTube channel, all that good stuff, your background, etc. Did we just uh, did we just uh, cover that? Uh, kind of. We kind of. Yeah. We kind of talked okay. about the name, but not really like how. Okay. You yeah. Know, we so, know you're old school. You're OG. Okay. So um, I think the the easiest way to to do this is from the genesis of of uh, how I got into guns, which is I was raised around this stuff. I know a lot of guys are. A lot of guys aren't as well. There's a lot of new shooters too, but. Uh, I was raised around guns. I was told to go hunt, you know, when I was, when I was, you know, young, uh, I was given a 22, uh, because I was gaming birds off the top of the, off the top of the, uh, the barn with my pellet gun. So rather than have me do that, they just gave me a 22. And then I graduated from feathered to furred. And then it was all history at that point in time. Wow. So um, you were raised where in Ohio? In Ohio. Yeah. Okay. Um, the range is actually on the family farm. We carved out a part at the uh, at the back of the property uh, that allows me to uh, you know to have our own range and allows us to produce the content we do without a whole lot of interference. Um, right. You know, that's um, cool. It's always good to have your own place. So, what do you mean you were told to go hunt? Like your dad gave you a gun and he was like, "Go get your food." No, not none like like go, oh. <laughs> go shoot stuff, right? Okay. That this got to remember. This is back when like twenty two could be bought in bulk packs for like $4 of mm -hmm. like the 550 bricks, right? When was so, that, in the 80s, 90s? Yeah, like I was born in 1987. I'm 30 years old. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, when I was five, six years old, you know, early or early 90s at that point in time, mm -hmm. you know, we had a multi, you know, a, a couple hundred acres and, uh, you know, hey, go shoot groundhogs and stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. Right. And that's how I got into a lot of trouble and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Oh, you but, got into trouble? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought that was uh, supposed to keep you out of trouble. You would think, but no, totally. Um, the one time I shot a power line down, that was, that got me into a fair amount of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> On your bad. property? On the property. Yeah. But AAP was really pissed. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. How did you shoot a power? You shot the actual line going across. Yeah, yeah. People say that you can't do that stuff, but you totally can. Um, however, I will, um, I will say that that power line had multiple hits. On yeah, it from already. you or from other people? Actually, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say that that was my younger brother. Um, uh, you see him on the channel every once in a while. Uh, Mr. Tactical Bacon is his name, and again, he picked that name back before CMMG started making Tactical Bacon. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> like he just he just blurted it out one day in a video, and I'm like, okay, well, that's gonna stick, right? Um, but he was a shooter too, 
uh, he's two years younger than I am. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't tell it from looking at him because he's ginormous. But um, and we just kind of started doing this sort of stuff. And then eventually he'd left to, for the for the United States military. Um, I was kind of left to handle it myself, so to mm -hmm. speak. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, but anyway, moving, moving forward, um, uh, from, from childhood, you know, I, um, I've always kind of had like a sciencey side of me. Uh, I was always kind of like a science nerd, but I was also the athlete at the same time. And I, I went to school and, uh, got more and more into guns when I was, when I was in, in college. And then I got out and that's when I started the channel after spending lots of time on the forums and stuff like that, seeing the types of content that were out there. And, uh, and we just started, started doing our own thing. Right. Because besides, you know, I know yeah. people see the facade and they draw their own conclusions, but you're really like a nerdy kind of guy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like, um, I, I held degrees in biological sciences and chemistry and I was a, um, I, my, initial career was a scientist, uh, predominantly chemist chemistry. And, uh, and that's kind of how I got into, um, kind of the testing evaluation mm -hmm. side of things. Mm -hmm. Um, cause, um, we do two things here really, uh, as far as the, as far as like my business is concerned, you know, we, uh, we do the video thing that everybody sees and is glamorous and all that sort of stuff. And then we do the other side of things, which is the grueling, boring, uh, testing and evaluation of equipment. Oh, so, so you uh, test stuff for people. Are you full time in this now, or are you? Because I oh, remember yeah. when I met you, you were kind of like doing both both careers. Yeah, yeah. I had both careers going uh, for a while, um, and then some things happened uh, uh, with the government um, that affected uh, my cool guy job that I was doing. Um, I mean, cool guy as in cool nerdy guy job that I was doing. Uh, I've never been a cool guy, cool guy as the industry sees them. Um, you know, I'm just a nerd, right? Um, but um, because of those happenings in the government, uh, that job kind of went away. And okay. uh, I found a need to basically, um, I, I came to the conclusion that having your whole livelihood come from one source is a really bad idea. So yeah. I kind of went to, I tried to diversify and stretch myself out a little bit more to to give myself some more financial insulation. And that's kind of where the business model behind uh, what VSO does was uh, born. And it's been evolving ever since. So uh, we get guns in uh, from manufacturers in various stages. Um, it could be a complete prototype. It could be a finished product that's ready to go to market. Um, and we evaluate that gun. Because a lot of people don't realize this um, who aren't in the industry. Um, a lot of gun companies don't have places to test their no. equipment. Well, they're also in places where um, the guns they're making, in a lot, not every case, but in a, in a lot of cases, the, they can't even own the guns or people can't, regular people can't own the guns that they're making in, in those states. Right, right, 100%. Yeah. Um, Ohio is a relatively free state. The only thing that we have uh, going against is you can't drink and carry. I think that's about as uh, non-American uh, as you can get. Uh, yeah. Here in Ohio. <laughs> uh, but... Um, just about everything else is pretty much legal here. Um, oh, excuse me. You can't have binary explosive in the state of Ohio. Oh, really? Which is, yeah, you can buy it, but you can't mix it. Oh, because, right? yeah, I was going to ask you, how come you're a chemist, but I don't see more, like, big bangs? You should have, like, your own VSO, you know, brand of oh, I explosive shit. I totally could. Yeah. Oh, I totally could. Uh, I could totally, you know, do some chemistry stuff and, and whip, whip something up good, but that stuff's totally illegal in uh, the state of Ohio. Oh, so. okay. So I know we got a question earlier from uh, Chris B, and he wants to know, like, what part of Ohio are you in? North, South, East, West? He's in. The, we are uh, North Central. He's in North Central. We are in the. Uh, we are in southeastern Ohio, is what we would be classified as. To put it in perspective, um, when I ship guns back to manufacturers, um, if they if they want me to use FedEx then I use the Wheeling, West Virginia FedEx. Oh, okay. That's how, that's how close we are to West Virginia. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. My, my brother, for some reason, likes West Virginia. Uh, they're the kind of... <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I have lots of family in West Virginia. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're a little bit too blue blooded for me over there, in my opinion. Oh, okay. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, that's probably like a different part because I know he's in, um, he's in Delaware, but he likes, he's always telling me that he's going to move to West Virginia because I think he likes the gun laws better, obviously, than Delaware. Oh, yeah. Better than yeah. Delaware. But, uh, you know, West Virginia's gun laws are actually not half bad. Uh, their hunting regulations are retarded, right? And that's no offense to uh, people who are born with disabilities. The, mm -hmm. the, the hunting laws in West Virginia are absolutely asinine. Oh, um, really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't hunt there anymore. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, so you used to. Okay, cool. Yeah. Let me see if there's any other. Um, Mike Bryant said he, uh, he missed what VSO means. So we'll tell you right now, VSO is... Very shitty operator. <laughs> yep. That's, you missed uh, the beginning, so we can't tell you what it really means. You have to yeah, rewind back yeah, to the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's yeah. what you get. But what it means now is very shitty operator. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, someone actually gave that up. So there you go. Okay, let's see what else. Um, there's a lot of questions here about clocks. <laughs> You know, people want to know about your love of Glocks or not, but I guess those are oh. probably people that have been watching your channel for a long time, right? Yeah, uh, actually, it's funny that they bring that up because um, um, we were hypercritical in uh, of Glock at the beginning, and um, and I can honestly say that we have since softened our position, um, having been throughout the industry uh, for several years, and we've seen some of the manufacturing. Uh, processes behind some of the other guns in the in the industry and um, there's a lot of companies cutting a lot of corners right now to try and stay competitive and the one company that is that I have come across that is not doing a whole lot of that stuff is Glock so the I'm not saying that that the uh, that the gun is the most awesome gun in the world that you should absolutely positively own. And, and I, you know, I'm not a Glock fanboy in any way, shape or form, but I will tell you this, a Glock is a very effective tool because it is good enough to work at least the majority of the time and shitty enough that if the cop takes it off of you for using it in self-defense, it's pretty much replaceable. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's my stance on that gun, and I own several of them. In fact, um, the one that's clipped to my my uh, my uh, gym gear right now is a Glock 19. Uh, I use them for suppressor testing too. Um, you know, right here I have a Sig, but yeah, you know. I mean, and, and you know, when you say because <laughs> I, I was laughing to myself when you talk because I've seen you go try to go to the Glock booth. <laughs> <laughs> and those guys like a shot show and those guys go uh-uh <laughs> no we well, don't want actually, you over here <laughs> well it's funny i've i've since made some friends with the guys uh from from the glock booth cool um yeah you know a couple a couple of people at glock you know uh, we exchange emails on a regular basis that's good um you know as far as you know no no there's been some healing going on there and you know i've had a conversation with them uh, about you know kind of our stance on their product and where it was at the time where we were making that remember the gen 4 had just come out right back then like, yes like get the, yeah get the blue box glock and shoot it in the first cartridge is a vertical stove pipe right and you're like whoa what's going on here right they've addressed all those issues and they're ready for gen 5 now apparently so yeah well, um, what do you think about that um have you do you have any insight on the gen 5 are well, you, are you under any kind of embargo where you can't talk about it? No, I don't okay. have any information on the Gen 5. Um, I would like for them to send me some information on the Gen 5. Uh, um, yeah, we all would. <laughs> we would yeah, all we, like to know all, about the Gen we, 5. We would all like to know about the Gen 5. I'm I think we're going to find out soon, right? When is that event that they were going to release it at? Um, I'm not sure. There's some kind of event that's coming up. I think, um, isn't NRA having like a carry guard? Oh, yeah. I... Uh, the NRA doesn't invite me to their stuff. <laughs> okay, that's okay. They uh, don't they, invite me either, so. Well, so no, they, uh, we can get to that topic Oh, <laughs> oh that's one of those uh, other, that's yeah, the one you haven't, like, made nice with? <laughs> um, no, they've been, I, I don't have a problem with the NRA. Um, apparently, they have a problem with me, though. <laughs> so, okay. Um, okay. yeah, 
we can get to that later. Uh, yeah. Remember that whole zero fucks given thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, one of my zero fucks uh, angered them. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, so yeah. someone remind us to circle back to the NRA. Now, so we were talking about the uh, Glock situation. What kind of, what, what do you think it's going to be? Um, I'm hoping that um, that they address some of the issues uh, around, well, actually, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if that's insider information or not. Okay. Well, think uh, about that I for a second. That yeah, because yeah. I definitely have no information. Um, I am in the Glock T and E program, but I haven't heard anything. Um, I haven't, you know. I mean, I I don't even know who's doing uh, social like social media marketing or marketing at Glock anymore. I did have a friend. My friend Kai was. Uh, there was a big shakeup over there recently. Um, yeah. That remember those that list of things that we don't talk about. Um, oh. We're gonna add. <laughs> We're going to add oh that one to it, right? Oh, uh, okay. There's some, there's <laughs> there's some, some things there. Yeah, we, we, okay. But the thing, from my perspective, because I don't know anything on it, um, you know, I don't really have any kind of insight there. I know when they came out with the, um, what is it? What's the optic ready one called again? Uh, uh, MOS. MOS. When they came out with MOS, they actually sent it to us before they released it. And we had to sign NDAs and all that kind of good stuff. But like I said, back then is when I had one of my friends was working there and she was pretty cool. And she uh, hooked us up with that. And we, we were able to do something on this particular thing. I'm just guessing like anyone else. I hope they didn't go put freaking safeties on there and make that an option now. I don't I don't think that they would. Yeah, um, um, I think to, to be honest, I think it's going to be repackaged. I think there's going to be a few twerk or tweaks here and there. I think it probably, if I'm honest, is probably going to come with some forward slide serrations on it of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, it's not going to be you're, you're not it's not going to be any like massive drastic change in your opinion, no. right? No, um, I don't think so. I do. I do believe that it's probably going to have MOS capability on it. Right, it's probably yeah, gonna have like the ability. The whole line, yeah, the whole line's probably gonna have, you know, the ability to put various, you know, optics on it. But right. again, I'm just guessing. Yeah, it's just guessing. Maybe we'll get a better trigger. <laughs> yeah, maybe. You know, but, but I, you know, I don't have any problem with Glock triggers. I never change my 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 triggers on a Glock. No, uh, do me you? Either. Yeah. No, me either. No, I I don't. I refuse yeah. to actually. I don't really do anything to a Glock. Now I've got Glocks. Like we've built a. Um, have you ever built up a eighty percent Glock? I have not. Yeah. I'm, so we've done some of the polymer eighty stuff and all that. I just did it to see you know what it was. But really, I I buy Glocks and I don't change shit. <laughs> yeah. I don't I, change. I typically. Yeah, I typically don't change anything. Um, I've seen, I have a few friends um, who do that sort of stuff, and I just, I just haven't really. Ever since I've tried it once, I, I just stick to the standard one that they put into the gun. It seems to go well. Uh, there is an individual uh, in our circles that mm -hmm. had an after factory trigger in his Glock and dropped it and discharged a 40 caliber round uh, through both of his tibia and fibula. Um, I think I heard Wax, about that. <laughs> yeah, Glock's kind of yeah. funny now, yeah. Yeah, uh, um, so who, is, who says this? Uh, hold on, let me see this. So Gun Carrier says, learn about the details of the new Glock in an hour on Gun News Weekly. So while we're, we're gonna probably still be here talking in an hour, if anything comes up, Someone like hit us up with a link or let us know that there's something going on there. We'll go over and take a look at it and we'll talk about it, you know? Um, yeah, I don't think there's going to be any huge drastic change. Do you think we'll see, do you think we'll see a carbine? Oh, I would love to see a carbine. <laughs> no, I, I seriously would because yeah, so, yeah, everything, so. everything that, um, I mean, that's like one of the standard options for most nine millimeter carbines, right? Yeah. Is a um is a Glock fed, you know a Glock magazine fed. Uh, yeah, I mean you know here, here's the thing. Like people think I'm joking, but I'm pretty sure their asses have a carbine. They've developed one. I'm pretty sure they have. You think? I, I think they've developed one. I don't. I don't have any special news or anything like that. No one told me anything, but I I'm pretty sure Glock has a carbine. And so many people have, like you just said, have made a, a, you know like AR. 
15 platform or whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, nine millimeters that use Glock magazines. That's, that's kind of like a holy grail that everyone's been searching for. And to be honest with you, no one's completely accomplished it, you know, 100% because a lot of people say they get last round bolt hold open and they don't. You know, there's a debate of whether or not that even matters. I don't know what you think about it. There's a couple of good ones out there. We recently did a video on the um, the CMMG guard. I actually have a second one in the queue uh, where we went and so did a bunch of silencers on it to see how okay. it uh, see how it worked as well. That one will be releasing in the next couple of weeks or so. But okay. um, but uh, they, they it's a 45 caliber one. Uh, it runs off of Glock 21 magazines. And it has last round bolt open and works great. Um, it, but it, the mechanism is completely different that, you know, they had to redesign that whole mech inside yeah. to make sure that it would function that way. Right. Um, and now the, we, have to, we have to talk about the reason why Glock mags are chosen for this role, right? Right. Yeah. Um, it's because problem. they're ubiquitous. It's not because they're the best magazine. Um, and I would argue that... Um, it, any magazine that goes from double stack to single stack is going to be less efficient. And you can see this, especially when you get to the higher cap magazines, um, right. they tend to have feeding issues uh, right. ex, uh, because you've got all that stack pressure pushing up on one round. So that round towards the, uh, when you first start shooting the magazine can typically be really tight and be slower um, on the, on the pickup. Right. Oh, okay, so quickly yeah. before we before you go any further here, let me just like you know have the little like learning part of the conversation today. Ubiquitous for anyone who wants to know means present, appearing, or found everywhere. <laughs> so, you know, we said VSO was a nerd, so <laughs> yeah, uh, I had yeah. to go look that up, and make sure uh, I knew exactly what it meant. My no, bad, my bad. No, no, it's cool. Uh, no, I like it, man. No, uh, but like seriously, you, do that. you can walk so, yeah. in. And you can walk just you can walk in just about anywhere and find Glock 17 magazines or Absolutely. also Glock 21 magazines. Have them. Yeah, a yeah, lot and, of us have them. Yeah, I mean they're I mean come on. The Glock 19 is arguably one of the most popular carry handguns if not the most popular carry handgun in the United States. Absolutely. So, so finding magazines for it is a no-brainer and and, and any company that doesn't offer a Glock fed carbine for their nine millimeter carbine is missing missing the you know yeah. they're they're screwing up yeah. right a lot of now, folks go with that um what you call it mag the um the cult mag but no one wants magazine. those yeah because you don't people don't want to have two separate mag magazines in their bag or whatever it is no i 100 agree now as far as the cult magazine is concerned i would argue that as far as feeding efficiency it's a it's a more efficient magazine because it's a true double stack magazine is designed exactly. to feed a machine gun, not a nine millimeter pistol, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Big difference there. So the feeding efficiency is going to be much higher on a standard uh, Colt magazine than a Glock magazine. But so, so, the, so that would make those better if you know if you don't care about what magazines you get. Yeah, if you don't care about what magazine and you don't care how hard they are to load, Colt magazines are terrible to load. Towards the bottom, they get really tight. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I mean, wear gloves when you're doing it because they're, they'll cut you. But once they're loaded, as far as making sure that round gets from the magazine into the chamber, right? Mm -hmm. The Colt magazine would be where it's at. But, uh, again, you can't find them at Walmart. Yeah. So now let's, uh, hold on a second there. Let's just stop again for a second. Now, um, in the hangout, uh, Mike Bryan is saying that um, there's a Gen 5 poster that's circulating on Facebook and Instagram, and it is a fake. That's what he's saying. Oh, definitely. Yeah, so here, let me see if I can uh, hold this up to the camera, and you guys can get a look at that right now. And that would be what's circulating on Instagram, but that's a fake. Right? Um, I don't really know what's different in there. It looks, you know... I don't really see anything in there. I don't know like who put that up there or whatever. But yeah, that's a fake. We don't really have any news on it yet. I'm sure we'll we'll see something when that comes out. Yeah, so to get back to the what we were saying is that if you there are there are a few of those cult magazines one out ones out there and if people don't care, they can go with those, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, we yeah. have uh we have we have one and it works great. Yeah, I you know, it, it shoots great. 
Um, Which company do you have one from? Um, uh, Bacon built it. It's, oh, uh, Bacon built it. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's a hodgepodge. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, it's got it's one of the dedicated ones though. So the 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 important thing that that you need to recognize, and I'm sure that somebody who makes these things are going to be pissed off at me for this, but do not convert an AR-15 lower to nine millimeter by the blocks, right? Don't buy a block to put in your lower. Buy a dedicated milled lower for so whatever what's, magazine what's, you want. Like, yeah, so what's wrong with the, um, going the block route? The block route, they don't, you're sticking a polymer or metal block up in there and they, they don't necessarily fit well and there's tolerance issues. Like they had to make it so, so that it will fit in the thing and not be super hard to put in there, but also function. And then you got dirt, you know, more places for dirt to fit. And, and then the, you're definitely not going to have a last round full hole open, right? Mm -hmm. Capability. And then the other issue is when you talk about nine millimeter, remember the bolt face is missing on the, um, on the bolt carrier, right? Like that plunger gizmo at the front is missing mm -hmm. on a nine okay. millimeter bolt. So when the bolt reciprocates, there's a hole. And where does that hole lead? Right to the guts of your gun, mm. right where the hammer rides, right? Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a dedicated nine millimeter lower, there's a gap there and Murphy's law, when you need it to run, <laughs> That yeah. casing is going to bounce off that, that shell deflector, drop right inside your thing, and it will lock your gun up. And by lock your gun up, I mean you're going to be taking the barrel off to get yeah. that thing out. Yeah. yeah. So, so, um, so Mike, is, Mike Bryant is saying he's asking if it's a fake. You're saying that's definitely a fake, right? Oh, this that? Thing? That yeah. poster? Yeah, it's got to yeah. be a fake. Yeah. 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 And I don't really see anything in it that's different. It just looks like uh, Gen 4s. Yeah. So that's that's why I say it's a fake. It doesn't look like there's anything different on there. No, it's a pretty yeah, good right. fake, right? Yeah. But I'm gonna say yeah. that it's it's I don't know who posted this. Let us know who posted this and then maybe that'll help us figure out uh let me know exactly who posted this. I want to invite everyone again watching this, uh hit the like button and share this video on your social media. Let folks know we're having this uh conversation. Um Wardex says there's leaked photos on Guns America blog. Okay, let's go. Let's go take a look at the Guns America blog and see what well, the uh, guns. They can they can say all that sort of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, I I don't know. Yeah, I'm just gonna tell you that I don't think that that I've seen some of the inside workings of like how my friends at that that work at glock work and the whole leaking of stuff this isn't the clinton administration yeah right like, right yeah. We know. yeah they don't they don't play around no yeah whoever is responsible for leaking that if they did it will be fired <laughs> yeah i don't so. and i don't see anything on the guns america blog yet if someone has a link um send it to us and we'll we'll take a look at it and talk about it and you know and i would also say that just about any I would say any media organization that's within the industry uh, that would post those leaked photos if they were legitimate um, would probably get some get some talking to. We'll put it that way on the back end. Yeah, I doubt that's going to go well, you know. And I'm sure that they signed an NDA and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's going to, I think it's going to be out pretty soon. I don't think, I don't think you're going to see a carbine. That would be cool though. I think that's how we got into this conversation, right? Yeah, that's how, we, that's how we got yeah. to the carbine. People think it's like a dream that we're talking about the carbine thing, but so many people have made a carbine and not like, I don't, I haven't seen, now you said you've seen some companies that have made pretty good versions of the carbine. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's, there's some good, there's some good carbines out there. Um, the two of note, like I said, the first one is the uh, CMMG. Uh, the one that's in 45, it's called the guard. And then the other one that I really like is the, I'm going to butcher this one and Rich is going to kill me, but the Angstad arms. Oh, okay. Angstad. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I add well, a little bit of Viking Angst to the Angstad? end of it. Angstad? <laughs> yeah. I add a little bit of Viking to it just for effect. Right. I asked him how it should be pronounced. He's like, I don't care. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I really like their gun. Their gun is the one that we used for the thousand round test 
on the uh, on the uh, shell shock technologies ammunition. Right. Okay, we wanted you to got see last round bolt hold open on that. Um, I believe that one has last round bolt hold, hold open. Okay. Don't quote me on that. I believe it does. Yeah. So, do you but even it, think that's important? Um. Yes and no. <laughs> yes, it's in in my opinion. Yes, it's important uh, because um, if you shoot the gun long enough, you can tell when it's when it needs fed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You can tell the difference, uh, especially if you're shooting suppressed, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, everybody who's shot an AR long enough will tell you that. Um, I think it's important because um, although I run the charging handle, mm -hmm. uh, it makes the that whole cycle easier and uh, it's just it's just better it, because if you if you shoot from the workspace you retract the firearm like this when you go to load it and if the if the breech is open right the bolt is back uh, the whole reason we we move it to this position i'll grab my short bow rifle here for this demonstration the reason we retract it like this is so that we orient the bolt towards the ground. Mm -hmm. And what that does is when we work the charging handle, anything that's not supposed to be in there falls out. Well, right. if the thing is already locked to the rear, when we retract it like this, there's another chance for it to fall out by itself. See what I'm okay. saying? Yeah. Right. That's where I see the value in last round bolt hold of it. Um, because I'm going to come back here, put the magazine in, work the bolt anyway. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'm kind yeah. of, I subscribe to the thing you have 100%. Um, the brain's always kind of on record thing. And that's just from the, the study of the art of shooting the gun, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have any military experience or anything like that that guides that. It's just from my perspective, it will work 100% of the time if you work the charging handle. Right. Okay. Yeah, I understand that. And I think why some people want the last round bolt hold open or lock back is so that, because that little thud that it does, you know, you kind of feel that and you know, okay, this thing's locked back versus like there's some kind of problem or whatever. It's a little bit of an indicator. I don't know how important. Yeah. That I, is. I mean, as a person who's never been shot at, I can't tell you if you're going to be able to feel that or hear that or smell that or any of those things associated with the way that happens or whether you're going to be able to differentiate that from a malfunction uh, under stress or not. Yeah, right? you probably shouldn't train for that. <laughs> no, no, I do yeah. I, have, I do a lot of force on force training um, and I can I have seen myself do it, be able to tell that it is that thing. Mm -hmm. Does for what percentage of force on force training equates to live bullets? I don't know. I can't tell you. Yeah. Right. Never. Yeah. Been yeah. And you'll never know until you get in that situation. So I know yeah, that. I some, yeah. I think it's probably Crispy that sent me this. He sent another. Uh, I think there's memes going on right now. Okay. I can't zoom in on this. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's memes out there right now. This one is from Guns and Gear. <laughs> yeah. I saw that one and earlier. That's not a Glock. <laughs> I can tell no, you that. I, right saw, now. I saw that one earlier today. <laughs> I laugh. Yeah. So for anyone who's listening to this, basically, because we have this, we put this up on iTunes. For anyone who's listening to it, it's uh, basically a high point. Yeah. <laughs> As the bar has been raised again. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, yeah, I could tell you they didn't go that route. We're just all going to have to wait, I think. Um, maybe you like maybe like a day or two before you might see something because, you yeah. know, it's it's happened that things have leaked out there. But. All right, so I definitely don't think there's going to be any kind of carbine. No. Now the other option that I would say is maybe new finishes. You know, yeah. on the you know they may offer some you know some factory Cerakotes or something like that. Uh, you know, those are those are good options. I mean, they they do add value to the gun. I mean, yeah. not the 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 finish the stock finish is fine. It works fine. It holds yeah. up pretty good. Um, but uh, people, I don't think people realize because there are other colors out there that you can get, but those colors are not coming directly from Glock. Right. Those are distributors that are painting or Cerakoting them or doing whatever. And technically, when they do that, 
um, that you know you have to think about your warranty there, right? Because if you modify your Glock, technically Glock doesn't cover it anymore. Right. You know. Now they may have some like kind of back end deal that says, you know, hey, you, you you're cool to do this, and we'll still cover the warranty. I don't know if that exists or not. I'm not privy to that information. Um, but anytime you do any kind of modification to the gun, adding yeah. new sights to the gun, adding new triggers to the gun, anything like that, you technically for the yeah. warranty. So. Yeah, and then you have to deal, because I, I, I had a friend who had a problem. He had one of the Cerakoted ones from some, one of the of the uh, distributors, and there's a few of them that do that, and then he had problems with it, and when he called up Glock, they were like, yeah, technically that's not covered anymore. If it's a different color, we don't do that. <laughs> so, um, but they, you know, they still try to help him out, and then what he found out was the problem he was having was because of the Cerakoting. So, like some, not the seracoding itself, but the process of seracoding. I think there was like some junk or something left in there, and that's what was creating the problem. You know, which he eventually got that fixed. The thing is, is that's why it would be like I'm sure there's folks out there going, who, get, you know, what does that mean if they're coming out with colors? It's a big deal because that's now covered by that. Yeah. 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 So you Pretty know. Different. Yeah, absolutely. So that's what you would be um, you would be getting there. Okay, so you know what we we can uh, spin back around. What was the thing we were supposed to talk? Oh, NRA. Yeah, yeah. yeah so w was this? We cannot talk about it, or we can't. No, talk we can. About it? We can talk about it. We can talk about it. So what did you do? What did you do? VSL? What did I do? I posted a photo right when they. Um, it was a mock up of one of the photos they published, and it was of an individual. Um, who had who was drawing their firearm and had their finger inside the trigger guard? This individual um, is a combat wounded veteran. Um, his hand was destroyed by shrapnel and it was reconstructed. You know all that all that jazz. There's a whole backstory to this whole to this whole thing. But mm -hmm. um, my issue that I cited in the photograph that I or the meme actually that I made. Mm -hmm. um, was not with him, right? That dude's still doing it, right? Even though he got his hand blown off, right? Like, mm -hmm. more power to you, bro. Right. Uh, more stones than I got. My problem was with the NRA and the whole support structure that that photo had to go through before it was published by the NRA. Which is supposed to be against their, their own rules. Huh? Is that what you're saying? Because yeah. that against technically their... would be against their own rules of safety. Yeah. So it's a photo that shows somebody. And remember, a photo is worth a thousand words, right? A picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and a video is worth even more because it's a bunch of photos, right? right. But, but you have a, a snapshot in time of an individual that the layperson may or may not know uh, this person's background or anything like that. They see this guy pulling this pistol from the holster um, with his finger in the trigger guard, right? That sends all kinds of bad messages, and it's not his fault, right? Mm -hmm. Why? The questions we have to ask are, one, who's the photographer? Why did it leave? Why did that image even leave his camera, let alone get downloaded to his uh, machine? Who edited the photo, right? Who commissioned the photo? to see, uh, to, to get it put on the carry guard thing, right? How many levels of bureaucracy did that go through? Oh, so this is recent. It's part of the whole carry guard thing? Yeah, it's, whole, it's part of the whole carry guard thing. Okay. And it's all centered around how many people at the National Rifle Association dropped the ball before this photograph uh, had to be published, right? And it wasn't just me that said stuff, but I think that I probably got the most hits on my yeah. photo. Um, well, there's a couple of things here that we should unpack. <laughs> there's a couple of things. Yeah, uh, yeah. Take it yeah. Away, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, one, um, yeah, this happens a lot with the NRA, right? I mean, they're a very big organization. They've got people doing, you know, like real prof professionals. They're not like us, who we go over everything, and we still have mistakes to go out there, I'm sure. Oh, I yeah. know, I do. But, you know, they're a really big organization. A lot of things they just leave up to people. And, and yes, there's probably not, should be someone who's screening all of that. But they're just doing so much stuff that it gets by them, I think. 
you know, look at look at what happened. Um, did you did you go to NRA? Did I see you out there? I did. I did. Yeah, I think I I think I saw you there. Yeah, yeah. we were. Yeah, we were there. Yeah. yeah. We, oh we, yes, I was hanging out with you. I remember. Yeah, that. yeah, we were. At, uh, we we touched base at Eric's event. Yes, right. You and I were hanging out at the um, Iraq veteran thing after that. So, if you do, you remember the whole thing that happened with um, the U.S. CCA that they disinvited them? Yeah. Like right before yep. the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then it I'm was. Waiting, because, I'm waiting for the NRA to disinvite me to their show yeah, before yeah. the next one. When you but, show up there, they're like, "There's going to be a big sign." <laughs> well, I'm a life member, so even if they yeah. bar me, uh, even if they bar me uh, as media, right? I still have my life membership. So yeah, no, there's no way. If they listen, okay. First of all, we're just joking around, but in all seriousness, if you go, because the next one's in where is it? In Texas somewhere, Dallas. Yeah, yeah. So the next one in Dallas, if you're there and they don't let you in, you have to let all of us know. Oh, yeah. Because I, I, I will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let all of us know. That will be news. That would yeah. be news. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Immediately let all of us know because that will be a thing. You know? <laughs> but, um, yeah, the fact that they disinvited those guys I think was a very bad PR move on their part. You know, and I wonder who really like okayed that. Like you're saying with this photo, who okayed to go? Yeah, a couple of days before this thing, when everyone's like, we've had these guys come out to this show all this time. A couple of days before this, we're gonna disinvite their asses, and then we'll put out our own thing. Yeah, and it you was, know? and then gun guys will love that. <laughs> it's purely because it's a competitive thing. USCCA's product directly competes, and I would, and if you ask a couple lawyers too, probably. Out competes the NRA carry guard uh, in many ways. Um, yeah, no, so, I get that that it's a competition thing, and they obviously have the right to do that. But it's still a dick move. Still no, dick it's move. totally a dick move. Yeah, right? I mean, you don't, you don't, you don't do that to other gun guys. We are standing on an island surrounded by enemies. Yeah, you don't, you don't start kicking people off the island just because they spit in your soup. Yeah, right. put them put them in the basement. They didn't have a basement. Actually, they put all of the NRA in the basement of that at the uh, what was it? The um, what was that? What was the um, convention center? It was I don't a, remember. Yeah, it was in Atlanta, and it was one of their big convention centers. But they put the NRA in the basement. <laughs> I hope they don't ever go back there, that. man. I did yeah. notice that. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that the NRA doesn't go back there because I thought that was bullshit. No, it was. Um, now the. Um, the convention center was the appropriate size this time. I will, I will say they did pick a, a convocation center that was of appropriate size. Do you remember uh, Indiana? Yes. The one in Indy? Yes. Dude, that thing was so crammed, <laughs> yeah. right? I didn't even want to be there. It was so tight, like yeah. you couldn't walk anywhere. I think the one in Kentucky was cool, right? No, yeah. no, that was because I think they're going to yeah. do that. The they're going to. I I think I saw somewhere that they're going to do that one again. But in Atlanta, man, we were like, we, you go into the thing, and then they're like, yeah, take those escalators down. And then there's people over there like, take another escalator down. Then there's people at the end of that one like, take another one down. I'm like, where the <laughs> hell are we going? <laughs> yeah, right, right. You yeah, couldn't you couldn't up. get to the show floor from the outside. You had to go in and then all the way down to the dungeon. Yeah. Right? Not to mention, like, Atlanta was not as much fun as you really think it would be. Yeah. I was actually somewhat pleasantly surprised with uh, the, the lack of riffraff that I was expecting to see in, the, in downtown, right? Mm -hmm. I was expecting to have, you know, you know, looking over my shoulder when I'm walking back to the thing at night. You know, I'm a mm -hmm. country boy, right? I don't, yeah. I don't do the whole concrete jungle thing. But right. I was very pleasantly surprised. I had a, I had a condo that was rented downtown on the main street in Atlanta. I can't remember the name of the street, um, but it was fine. Oh, really? Was, except for except for a couple, you know, aggressive panhandlers here and there, and no big deal, right? Yeah. Um, I know for uh, us, like, the thing that really disturbed me, I saw a lot of young homeless people. Uh, a yeah. lot of kids on the corner selling drugs, a lot of kids selling their bodies, uh, boys and girls. That's all. That was depressing to me. To see that, you know. Um, so from my point of view, I didn't really like that, but that's what Atlanta is nowadays. Yeah, from, from I didn't. I, um, I don't know if it just was the area I I was in. I didn't see a whole lot of that. I was pretty busy the entire time I was down there, mm -hmm. to be honest. So I didn't get to like walk the streets as much as I uh, probably would have liked. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I was there by myself. Yeah, it's a good thing. Too, yeah, we, yeah so. we don't want you walking the streets. Uh, I don't know yeah. if that was like a slip of the tongue. We don't want you walking the streets out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the other thing I want to unpack, though, BSO. Okay. So you are chastising someone on safety. <laughs> well, okay. I like that. I yeah. like the irony of, of, of well, BSO. You call it irony. I call it consistency, <laughs> okay. right? Uh huh. So no matter what, um, what you've watched from us or anything like that, um, we always follow the four rules of firearm safety, mm-hmm. right? The only time we will violate the first rule, which is treat all guns as though they're loaded all the time, um, is when we have meticulously gone over with the camera mm-hmm. and shown that it is a clear gun because it's we're 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 turning it in multiple directions for for people to see the 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 firearm. We're reviewing the gun. We're showing the features of the gun. You know, rather than do you know a bunch of pictures of the thing, it's sometimes it just plays better to pass the camera over it and show the the thing. Right? Some people mm-hmm. prefer that over the take th- a thousand photos and splice them into a video. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, we do both. Right. So whatever fits that particular gun, we will do that from time to time, okay. right? But we have all the safeguards in place, the guns triple check, all that sort of stuff, and usually it's the the whole gay safety check with the, yeah. hey, God, all right, it's unloaded, all that, you know, all that crap, right? Um, that's the only time we typically violate. Every other thing that we do will follow the four rules of firearm safety, period. Yeah, I'm right? not, I'm not knocking you. The, I'm not knocking you, but you but know think, you get some flack. I do, and I think that the biggest problem uh, with that is a lack, of, a fundamental lack of understanding of how the rules are written. Everybody gets an abbreviated thing at the range or from their dad or their uncle or grandpa or whatever on right. these four rules, and they're not instructed the four rules properly. They have specific words that they use, and those words have meaning. Right. Okay. So let's and, go down that before, you know, before we go any further, let's, let's like have that conversation again with people. I know, yeah. I mean, maybe some people are tired of that out there, but stick with us. So, okay. so give us those. Uh, first rule, you know, treat all guns as though they're loaded, um, uh, all the time. And it's a, it's about respect of the gun. So however you're handling the gun, you should respect the firearm as though it's loaded no matter what. So, um, there's a there's a video out that I recently dropped where I was putting a silencer on the end of a loaded gun. You should whether the gun's loaded or not, you should be putting the silencer on the exact same way. Just because the gun's unloaded doesn't mean that you can yeah. grab the can by the end of the thing and screw it on, right? No, you have to grab it around like this because that is the responsible way to put the silencer on the gun. Because you're conditioning yourself, you're conditioning yourself. That's part of it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the next one is the so it's it's gun trigger right so keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on target and you've made the decision to shoot right okay. so that one's pretty self explanatory the finger straight you know and that and the sh- the act of shooting right and the act of drawing and all the other administrative things that we do with the gun uh, are separate they're two separate actions and um, the way I like to say it is the, the act of shooting a gun and the act of drawing a gun or pointing a gun are two separate actions with their own distinct uh, physical, legal, and emotional consequences. Pointing a gun at somebody is not the same as shooting somebody with the gun, right? Mm-hmm. The legal aspects are going to be different. You're going to be charged with various things based on those. Um, things are going to happen differently depending on those two scenarios. And you're going to have to deal with that situation differently um, in your brain and on the outcome, right? So they're two separate things. Treat them that way. The finger doesn't go to the trigger until you've already lined the sights up, right? So the next one, and I actually, I actually argue the order of three and four, right? So okay. gun, trigger, muzzle, target, right? Um, muzzle, you never point your muzzle or you never let your muzzle cover anything that you are not willing to destroy, right? 
And that muzzle is the only thing that matters. You can point it in the direction of a target, right? And it might have a important thing next to it that you don't want to destroy, but you you don't you never point the actual muzzle at the thing that you care about, right? That you don't want to destroy. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see us a lot of times on video, you'll see if the camera's static on a tripod, it the the rifle might pass past the you know, pass over the camera. Right, because right? you better there's, be willing to destroy no... your camera if you're gonna make YouTube videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trust me, I just I just blew up a GoPro yesterday. Right. Uh, see it on Instagram. But um, if there's a cameraman working with me, you'll see that you'll see me draw an outline around that guy. Right. That muzzle goes up to the air around the person and back down where I'm wherever I'm going. Right. Because you never point that muzzle at them. Right. Does that violate a rule of firearm safety? Absolutely not. Right. Because shooting is a three dimensional activity. Right. We're conditioned that there's this 180 degree line that we have to shoot, you know, that there's an uprange and a downrange. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, if you do enough training, you'll see that if you do in that training, if it integrates real world case studies, you'll see that just about every situation, there are friendlies and bad guys intermixed. Right. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that we should go out and put our friends next to targets and stuff like that and shoot at them? Right. No, no, you shouldn't do that. That's irresponsible for everybody to go out and do that in an uncontrolled environment. If you want to do that sort of stuff, you, it's available, go buy it, right? Have somebody who's competent to teach you how to do that, teach you, right? They, you can be found. Um, but then continuing on, the fourth rule, or some would argue the third rule, is know your target, its foreground, and its background, right? So you can't, you can't just shoot the target if there's something important in front of it and behind it, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to be cognizant of the path of the bullet on its way to the target and what happens after it hits the target, right? right. Depending on the locale, um, the law may state that you are liable for everything that bullet does, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You are most certainly liable, no matter where you are, if that bullet contacts someone, some, something that you're not supposed to destroy uh, on the way to the target. In some locales, you may not be responsible for what it does after it passes through the target, right? If you get a pass through, it might be, you may not be legally held responsible for it, but I'm gonna tell you this right now. I don't know about you, Hank, right? And I don't know about the people watching here, but if my bullet passes through that scumbag and kills a four-year-old, yeah, I'm not going to be able to live with that. Yeah, you have I, to live I, with that I know forever. In here, I know in here, I am I might as well have died in that gunfight because I couldn't deal with that shit, right? Like mm -hmm. that's And the problem with that is we have to realize that the burden of being a good guy, right? Yeah, and no matter how guy, old that person is, it's not a good thing, you know? Um, no, yeah. The burden of being the burden of being a good guy is way more than that of being a bad guy. A bad guy just has to look. They're looking for change, right? They're looking for somebody to take off running so they can gun them down, or you know, they're looking for an easy target to rob or or whatever, right? Really care to rape me, but you know, mm -hmm. but <laughs> but um, they're looking for that opportunity. You as a good guy have to look for the proper opportunity that is not going to do more harm than good. Right. And that is a that is a huge responsibility that you have to take into account because the four rules of firearm safety are not just range rules. They are yeah. shooting rules that go everywhere with you. Yeah, and what you're training for and however you train, you know, when you get in when you get into something, hopefully you you never do, but you should you should be doing this realizing that you may this is something that may happen to you. Obviously, you know, most of us don't necessarily want it to happen, but if it does, you've got to deal with everything that comes after that. So, you know, that comes out of that situation. So the reason why we're talking about all that, because you have a couple of videos that we can put safely in the controversial <laughs> category, <laughs> right? Yeah, so, a couple. Yeah. yeah. So like the first one, though, I know you were talking about this suppressor video that you did recently. That was with a Q suppressor, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And uh, let me see, what was the um, what was the title of that video? 
there's actually two videos where it happens. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and what we're doing is the queue, uh, it's a, it's a, it's called the erector and it has a bunch of baffles that you can put on and off and for expediency. And I said this in, in the videos is, uh, I'm going to manipulate the silencer with the gun loaded. You probably should, there's a better way to do this. You should probably do it this way, but you guys are going to not sit here for 30 minutes and wait for me to do this. Right. Because mm -hmm. everybody's got an attention span of a gnat these days. I, and I, I'm, I'm with you. Right. Uh, I can't sit there for long periods of time and watch stuff. Right. So you lim you limit at the length of your videos. I try to. Okay. I say that I say if people ask me how long should a video be. I was like as long as it needs to be, right? Absolutely. If it takes 15 minutes to do something, it needs 15 minutes. Now, do those do the do people need to sit there and and watch me fiddle fuck around with a uh, with a silencer for an extra 15 minutes? because there wasn't an expedient way to do it, do it is if you, if you file, follow the four rules of firearm safety, then you can do it that way. Right. Um, and should look almost identical. The only difference is the gun will be cold. So the two videos that we did that on were, um, the dedicated video for the Q erector. It's called, uh, the erector named that on purpose mm -hmm. end quote. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the second video, uh, that people got really pissed off about, um, it seems like was called the ultimate assassin pistol. Um, and I don't know if it just, if they just, the title collect, didn't help or, well, I, I don't know if it collected a different audience because of, of that. I'm not sure. Uh, but people seem to be much more pissed off in the, uh, in the second title. Uh, yeah. the it's second definitely, video. it's definitely a salacious title. Um, I'm sure YouTube didn't like it, which we're going to talk about the whole YouTube thing in, in once we get through this. Yeah, actually, so, I'm going to pull that one up and see if it's monetized. Oh, okay. Yeah. So now here's the thing I'd like to ask you about the that the suppressor video where I guess you were handling it or installing the suppressor while it was loaded. Um, couldn't you just edit that out? So I know you're saying no one wants to sit there and watch you do that, but you could you could have done that and then just chopped all of that I out. did oh you did I did I did edit it out um, okay but I said in the video I'm gonna do it this way because of this I'm real with my audience and how I'm doing right things, oh, okay right? I tried to use I tried to use in the suppressor video specifically I tried to use it as a teachable moment mm -hmm. right as a something like hey this is the way I'm gonna do it right here right now uh, because of this reason but this is probably not the way that that is best to do it because of this reason. Yeah. Right. And if people get pissed off about that, then that's fine. But um, um, that video is monetized, by the way. It is monetized. Okay. Yeah. So now, were you trying to? Were you, were you deliberately trying to piss people off, or was this like a totally <laughs> accidental pissing off of the people? No, that one was a totally accidental thing. Like um, that. I don't think that I came off as smug or, or stupid or anything like that in, in that, in that it's just, I, I don't know if it's just because people don't thread things on the end of their guns on a regular basis yeah. or, or maybe they, their four rules of firearm safety uh, understanding is a little lax or maybe the practice of those rules is a little bit lax, yeah. but well, I'm going to thread this. I'm going to thread the silencer on the end of the gun the exact same way, whether that gun's loaded or not. Yeah, and in re exactly, because I think that's the thing that we have to cover here. Obviously, there's safety things. We understand why they're out there. Um, I think there's probably levels of, uh, of what you're going to do in this whole thing, right, based on who you are, where you are in your understanding and in, in, in your practice and all that kind of stuff of using guns. And, um, and then, you know, you have to think about real life in a real life situation, let's say with a suppressor, if you were going to put that suppressor on there for whatever reason, right? Are you going to go, oh, hold on a second. Let me unload this. Make sure it's yeah. safe. Now I'm going to put the suppressor on. Like you're saying, regardless, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't cover that muzzle anyway with your hand, right? Yeah, Makes sense. Never. You know, people do it, but you shouldn't do it. You should be training yourself to not do it. Yeah. Right. So regardless of whether it's 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 hot or cold, you're going to you know, you're going to do that. But in a real life situation, are you going to do all of that? Oh, let me unload this, make sure it's safe, you know, and then I'm going to put the suppressor on. You have to ask yourself if you're going to do that. So and I would say from this point that I'm in now, um, 
I think you have to think about what are you going to do in real life? Because if you train yourself and if you condition yourself to do something, when things go wrong and you're not thinking about it and you're just reacting, you're going to do that thing that you conditioned yourself to do. And it might not be the healthiest thing for you to do because you might, you might be safe from that piece of metal, but not safe from someone else's piece of metal yeah. that they're aiming at you. So now obviously I'm sure there's people out there, they'll get mad about that and you know carry on and all that kind of stuff. But the other part of it is that if you're an adult, if you're a grown up, and if you're really free, you are free to do whatever you want to do, including destructive things to your own self. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you do want to consider other people, obviously. Yeah. You know, when you're doing stuff. Now, um, what I'd like, I don't know if you wanted to, you know, to expand on that before I go on to the, to the video that was like, what was that? Um, was that a year ago? That was this past Christmas, the one that you're about to get to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that was back in Christmas. Okay. So why don't you tell us about this video? What is it? I'm trying to see. I've watched it. I know you had it on full 30 because you're one of, you know, you're like you and I were like both in full 30 and you're also in YouTube. Obviously I watched it on full 30 uh, a couple times. I think I watched it on YouTube too, but I can't remember the name of that video. Uh, it was called the four rule four. It was called the four and only rules of firearm safety. Okay. And it was an explanation. Uh, basically that little dissertation I gave you a few minutes ago, um, it was that in video format. And um, the whole purpose of that video really, well, there was lots of purposes to that video, but chief among them was to drive people to look internally about how they see firearm safety, right? So we conducted a drill um, where a shooter was shooting at a target that I was standing next to, right? Mm -hmm. And we conducted that, that whole uh, drill while I was reciting and explaining the four rules of firearm safety. Um, and we followed all four of them the entire time, not breaking one the entire time. Um, and um, it kind of, as expected, kind of pissed some people off. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it, I believe the video is still living on full 30. I well, think, I did, were you asked to take the video down? No, I think um, I think it was demonetized on YouTube. Okay. Um, yeah. Really? So I I I um, it, did someone report you or how did that happen? Yeah, I think that that's how it kind of went down. Was somebody reported the video, um, and it got a bunch of yeah. it got a bunch I, of. I'm videos. trying to find the video from the title that you're giving me. It's not coming up. Yeah, it's unlisted on YouTube right now. Oh, so, I see. It, okay, yeah, I was yeah, trying to pull it up. You, okay. So it's still accessible to all the places, like anybody who embedded the video anywhere, right? The video still plays, right? I didn't want to like take it down, so to speak, but mm -hmm. um, to make it less visible on YouTube uh, because people were, were reporting it a bunch and it, it, not that that matters because to be honest, I, I'm, I'm, I have an MCN that handles all that stuff for me. Mm -hmm. So they just send uh, me what's a what's the what does the I'm sure what it, the MCN is like a network thing, but what, what does it mean? Yeah, it, uh, I actually don't know what that oh. <laughs> means. So I, it's like some kind of network manager, right? Yeah, it's a network manager um, that and, you have for your channel, like a dude yeah. that you talk to that works yeah. out problems for you. Yeah, so they handle those problems. So when somebody reports a video, um, it actually doesn't inconvenience me at all. Um, it, like I get a report that basically says, um, hey, this video is reported, we fixed it. Yeah. You know, so, um, but, you know, it's one of those things where um, there's some, at least in my interpretation, there's some things that can decrease the traffic of your channel over time and frequent reports of your channel. Mm -hmm. I believe at least in my analysis of the Google um, algorithm, that they can influence uh, the way your channel's proliferated. So, right. I mean, after all, that's I think what happened with um, with Hickok forty five when he got shut down a couple of times, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. But his was all Google related. His was all the Google Plus stuff. You'll notice that we don't have any content over on Google Plus 
um, in support of that whole thing that happened. We're not playing those games. If, if Google Plus wants to do that sort of stuff, we're just going to stop using their platform. So, um, but back to the video. Um, so we put that out there. If you want to see it, you can go over to Full30. It's still up there. Um, it's e easily found. And if you find it in an article somewhere, it will be, it, you can watch it on YouTube. It's just out of the, it's unlisted. Yeah. Uh, so what were the purpose. big criticisms that you got from people? Obviously, that was like a whole firestorm that you were caught up in. Um, what were the big, uh, you know? The big criticisms, um, and some of them are actually, I have to admit, are somewhat valid, um, is that having that sort of content out on YouTube may, um, you know, people think that they can just go out and do that sort of stuff, and it's probably not the greatest idea um, to go out and do that sort of stuff if you're untrained. Um, because you can't take bullets back. Now, all the people that, uh, that were involved in this whole thing are very well trained, um, mm -hmm. marksmen. And, um, and, you know, even though it was a really cold day, um, we still managed to, to do all right with it. Um, um, the, the major criticisms with that, um, I, I would say, honestly, uh, other than that one, that having that kind of content out there sends the wrong kind of message to people. Uh, all the rest of the criticisms are kind of bullshit, really. Yeah. Um, because did, all did of you those do a disclaimer? Did you do a disclaimer in the beginning of that? I'm trying to remember. I believe at the beginning and the end of the video. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. right. Um, so, and the reason I say that the the rest of them are bullshit is um, a lot of the other criticisms all center around. Um, a fundamental lack of understanding of what the four rules mean, and that's what we covered, a, you know, a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you watch the video, they're they're laid out there, and you know, yeah, I mean, sure, it alienates some people. Um, I, I will say, there's one more criticism that I do have to. Um, I got a little bit worked up uh, during the video making process, and um, the criticism that that was voiced that I think that is, that is actually somewhat valid is I said in the video that, um, if you're uncomfortable with this sort of stuff, then you should seriously reconsider carrying a firearm. Yes. Um, I remember that. And you said some, was it, you also said something about flashlights or was that in the comments? Um, yeah, there, there is that. And we can get to that here in a second. Cause that's a whole nother <laughs> topic that that can evolve into another topic. That <laughs> yes. Like okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Uh -huh. Um, but, um, so I said that in the video, and it was interpreted as I should tell people, I'm telling people that they, they, they don't have a right to self-protection because they're not willing to do that. Yeah, like, people, like, so like, I think people probably took that as being very douchey, but that wasn't your intention. No, that's not my intention. My right. intention was twofold. One, to drive people to look internally at their own abilities, and two, seriously consider if they have what it takes if they're in a situation where friendlies and bad guys are intermixed, right? Mm -hmm. Because the chances are pretty good, right? That That's going to happen. Yeah. If you look at any case study of any shooting anywhere, any good shoot anywhere, there's typically other people that don't deserve to be shot, at least at, at that point in time, don't de deserve to yeah. be shot. Well, the, um, the, and the reality is, is look, I think there's, you know, like I was saying before, I think there's different levels of training that you do when you get into this, you know, and um, you're absolutely free to do whatever you want to do. When I was watching the video, I saw consen consenting adults, guys that I know for a fact from my own experience with those people that they're professionals doing something. You know, and, and so I didn't have any problems with any of it, but people, I think, don't really realize that there's different kinds of training here. And some of the training that you get, especially like we were talking about before from the NRA, for example, it's very, um, it's very clean and organized and, and I don't know what's the best word to use. Planned. For it. Yeah, planned antiseptic. So in other words, like this is the this is the most perfect situation that you can get into. Like you said before, this is just a 180 or flat situation that you're dealing with in front of you but the reality of what's actually going to happen in the real world which if that's what you're training for this is going to happen in the real world yeah you yeah. know so in the real world you, you're highly likely to have things like that go down and you can very easily have someone holding hostage someone that you care about and they could be pointing a gun at them 
and all that kind of stuff. And both of these people are in front of you. Someone that's your enemy and someone that you care about. Yeah, and I'm not telling everybody to go out and do confidence drills with live human beings, right? If you want to do that sort of stuff, seek out a professional who will teach you how to do it, right? In a safe, controlled uh, environment that will still benefit you. Because what you re really have to understand here is, as somebody who's taken a lot of training courses, is what you're trying to do um, when you, especially when you do force on force training, is you're trying to build a Rolodex. And I know a lot of people don't know what a Rolodex is these days, right? How old are, mm -hmm. how old are you? You know what a Rolodex is? I'm 45, so definitely. All right, you know what a Rolodex is, okay. <laughs> yeah. But for those people who don't know what a Rolodex is, a, a good example of this would be your contact list um, on your phone, right? You can take this, uh, where's my camera? Yeah, you can see all these and you can scroll through, right? And you can, the worst, thing that you can have is um, when, when, okay, first off, when something, when you're, pre, when you're presented a situation, you have to make a decision on whether you're going to draw your gun or, or go hands-on or any of that sort of stuff. Um, it's, you ha there's a response time, right? It's like the Windows icon that sits there and goes like this. I don't know. Are you a Mac user? You're probably a Mac yeah, user. Yeah, I'm a Mac user, yeah. but I've seen yeah, okay. Mac has a color wheel, which you don't <laughs> oh, want to okay. see. Okay, you have a color wheel. Okay, yeah. yeah. But it's sitting there spinning, right? Yeah. And your Rolodex is sitting there spinning as well. And what it's looking for is a similar situation that it was in last time, right? Something, something to land on so that it can find a way to go, either left or right, right? Mm -hmm. So it, if it lands on something, it can say this I did this last time and it went bad maybe I should go this way instead right mm -hmm. the worst situation that you can be in is that that Rolodex starts spinning and it never lands on anything and just sits there and goes and goes and goes and you can tell that this is the truth because how many times have you seen in like mass shooting events or or whatever people who are in shock maybe mm -hmm. even armed on the scene but they're in shock and the response time, they just lock up. Yeah, they don't do anything. They don't do anything. They right? don't even realize they're armed and it can happen to anyone. And it can happen to anybody. It could happen to me, it could happen to you, right? Absolutely. But our hope, yeah. our hope is that by putting ourselves in these inoculating situations, right, through like things like force on force training, um, is that we don't do that. So that when that wheel starts spinning, it lands on something as fast as possible and we can make a decision either fight or flight. Yeah. Right. And, and here's the reason why. Didn't we, I forgot this, I don't know if you, um, you looked into the story, but you know there was a story of a woman that was chained up in a shipping container? I'm not familiar with the story. Yeah, I think um, uh, someone out there will probably know this, but there was this woman that was missing, I think, for like six months, a year or something like that. She was with her boyfriend, someone else, and those people were killed. They found her on the property of this real estate agent that killed them in her presence. And then he captured her and kept her for something like a year or longer than that, chained up in a shipping container, basically, uh, you know, who knows what he did to her. And, um, and I think eventually, the, you know, the authorities uh, found her and they were able to rescue her from that guy. But think about this. Those guys are gone, you know, and I don't know what situation went down with them, but you have to realize that you're going to wind up, you, if, if you're going to get into something, if you're saying that you're carrying a firearm to defend yourself, you're not doing it for hunting, you're not doing it just, just because you like guns or whatever, you're carrying this to defend yourself, then you owe it to yourself to do some kind of training. You know, granted, I don't do as much training as I should. I'm going in a couple of weeks to do some training. I, I do believe in it. I think you got to take the time, spend the money and train. What are you training for? You're training for a real life situation. And if there's someone in front of you that's your enemy and someone in front of you that's the person you love the most in the world, and that other person has a gun and you have a gun, but you choose to not do anything, then that per that your enemy in front of you that has the gun, you belong to them. And the person Think that you love belongs to them. 100% correct. And um, the, I think the easiest way to sum that up is, um, if you're out, I mean, you're spending probably in disproportionate amount of time with Lola as opposed to any other individual in your life, right? Right. Right. So the chances are that you're going to be, that if you're uh, caught in a situation, that she's probably going to be with you. Right. Right. 
Should the first time that you send a bullet past her face to kill a bad guy be for real? No, I, I, I don't necessarily want it to be, no. No. You know, so and maybe... that's the thing. I know this sounds scary. This might sound to people like I see, like, you know, someone says I'm a tactical ninja. No, I'm not. I'm just, you know, I'm a big nerd. No, I'm not either. Yeah. I, I, I preface this whole thing by saying I'm just a nerd. Yeah, right? me too. I mean, that's an affinity that we have with each other. I'm really just a big nerdy guy, but I'm also a realist. I'm also thinking about what's really going to go down. Why am I doing this? If I'm doing this to protect the people that I care about, the people that I love, then you have to realize that th these people can can uh, wind up in front of the muzzle very easily. Yeah, lots of things that you care about can wind up in front of the muzzle, and you need to you need to think about that when you're out there. And I don't think it, because a lot of people don't actually train beyond you know, okay, you got a CCW, you did a class, and that's probably most most of the training that a lot of people out there get. I know there's people that go into the military, I was never in the military or law enforcement, but the truth of the matter is, is that for a lot of people that go into the military, they don't get good training when it comes to firearms, right? Especially with pistols. Um, now, I know some guys that have, who are military guys that, man, they can just, they can work it with a with a M4. You hand them that thing and they're just they're spinning the dials and they're they're hitting the targets and you know it's all it's all good, right? Hand, most of them hand them a handgun. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So this is the thing. I mean this is the thing. I think that if you if you get any kind of training, I mean I see some people talking about like for example in the chat, I don't know, um, we could we can get to it. I see people talking about Jaeger, for example, and tactical response, which you do you work for them or do you do training with them? What's the um, I train there I train there on a regular basis, took several courses there right. last year and this year. Um, I consider James Jaeger friend. Uh, and um, and also um, I would also call him mentor. Okay. Um, is that the uh, only place teacher? that you train? Huh? No, is that, that the is only? not the only. That's not the okay. only place that I train or have trained. Um, I am open to training just about anywhere. It's just, uh, and I'll leave it at this with that subject. Um, that um, tech response is one of the few places that I choose to return to on a regular basis. Right. Right. So yeah. they're 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 giving me something on a regular basis that I feel is worth traveling ten hours um, to go do, right. right? So yeah, I think this. Is I, I will train there again this year, um, as long as everything aligns properly, right? Right. Um, so well, the, the, they're and they're good people down there. I know that there's a lot of people out there that um, don't know them and don't like them, and you know what? That's fine. I, I'm not here to to go to bat for them or you know to explain why I go there to train. Um, that's something that is inside each individual, and you have to make the decision for yourself. Right. Yeah. And people people can you know people can say whatever they want to say about it. I think there's you know do we even have um, how many places in the country really do. Um, that kind of training because you know, there's lots of different kinds of training out there and I'm not knocking anyone for the training that they do But you if you want to go up a level from your basic uh, safety classes That um, which is what most people do. How many options do you have out there? There's lots of good options out there. I mean there are there are a lot of uh, quality instructors out there um, You have to travel to get to them um, I really want to go to Thunder Ranch. Um, hopefully, you know, my brother and I are talking about going to Thunder Ranch and and, uh, and training under Clint. Uh, I really want to take a um, – um, we, we, okay, Clint's getting older, right? And I'd really like to take a revolver class from the guy okay. uh, because, you know, that kind of generation is kind of, you know, let's be honest, disappearing mm -hmm. uh, for lack of a better way to say it. Um, and I feel as though whenever somebody like that passes, you lose the, like information mm -hmm. that you will never recover. Mm -hmm. There is stuff in his head that will never, ever be recovered, right? Um, and I believe that to be, to be a fact. So right. I want to go, go out there and take a revolver class, but it's also very difficult for me to say, I'm going to travel clear across the country to take a revolver class six rounds at a time, right? So I'd also really like to to take like um, 
like a high angle shooting long range marksmanship class or something like that. Um, cause that's one of the areas that I'm, um, you know, in, in Ohio, we don't really have those kind of ranges. Right. And don't get me wrong. I can shoot pretty far. Um, you know, I have fairly decent fundamentals, at least with, uh, with a rifle, um, mm -hmm. shooting it at distances. Um, I have hit thousand yard targets manually, um, and farther, um, just to qualify real quick. Um, but typically speaking, we don't have those kind of ranges, so I don't get to practice that art very well. And I'd really like to go study under for a esteemed professional like, like him in that, in that particular art. Right. So now what I'm the, the point I'm trying to establish here, and I'm not trying to give away anything for anyone, but a lot of places where you're doing training, um, it, when you're doing like, uh, a higher level training than what most people do, it's going to be three dimensional, right? Whether it's with um, actual firearms, uh, some munitions, uh, paintball, and whatever else you have, it's going to be a situation where you're going to be muzzling other people, right or wrong? Um, typically speaking, um, well, hopefully we're not muzzling people with uh, with live firearms, right? right. Uh, we don't want to, we don't want to do that. But um, you know, if we, we don't want to be in that situation. Uh, but we, again, have to bring into balance the understanding of that rule of fire. Yeah, or like safety. what degree? So, like, or for example, then, like what degree is that? Like, because what people think is that if your muzzle is, a, is, what is it, like 180 degrees, if there's a person anywhere in that muzzle, is that what we're talking about? Or are we talking about a very fine, you know, so like you know exactly where your muzzle is, but there's someone in front of you, but the, your muzzle is not directly pointed at that person. Yeah, zero. Mm -hmm. One degree, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, there, I mean, and you can, I mean, I, I can go down a whole rabbit hole of examples of where this is used in real, in real yeah. world. Well, the right? thing but I'm trying to establish I here, like, that's, yeah, I don't think yeah. that it really adds anything to the situation. Now, no. mm -hmm. um, as far as force on force training is concerned, I highly, highly suggest that if you do take if you do take your response, uh, your personal safety as your own responsibility and you carry a firearm, that you owe it to yourself to spend the money to go somewhere to be trained in force on force, right? Um, because force on force, what it does is validate or un invalidate what you are doing in your personal training. So if something works for you, on the flat range, it may not necessarily work when there's another person or several other pre people that have a say in the situation, mm -hmm. right? So for instance, the bullseye shooting thing, right? Mm -hmm. Stacking the bullets right on top of each other, you know, like the fundamentals of shooting, right? Those fundamentals, some of them don't work at right now bad breath distance. Mm -hmm. They just don't. Um, you cannot you cannot put seven rounds out in one second and have them all stack because of the way you squeeze the trigger, right? Like you're going to jerk the trigger. There are things that you have to add to those fundamentals of shooting that, um, that allow you to get good hits without those other things that were previously getting you good hits. So right. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm doing a good uh, kind job. Kind of, but here's what I'm trying to do, because inevitably, and I'm pretty sure someone in the chat br brings up like the, the name Voda, because that's pretty much become a meme, right, at this uh, point. Yeah. I don't know if you know who I'm referring to. I know who you're referring to. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the thing is I'm trying to establish with people that I don't think everyone understands when you're looking, when they're looking at this stuff, is there's lots of different kinds of training out there. There's higher levels of training where people, like I've done force on force stuff with, um, with paintball. Right. Actually, I would say that that's um, as far if depending on what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? If you're doing like super close stuff, right? Where the whole um, the the biggest problem with a paintball is that it becomes a game, mm -hmm. um, and um, and you can game the the round too. Like when the ball's coming at you, you have time, right? Depending on how far away you are, they only go about 350 feet per second. I actually used to play uh, competitive paintball. So I know okay. a whole lot about this. Um, there's time when somebody shoots a ball at you. If you if you had if you made eye contact with what they were doing, you have time to move out of the way. 
Mm-hmm. Like you don't have time to do that when it's a real bullet. Now, at the right distances, paintballs work fine, right? Uh, because mm-hmm. you don't have time to get out of the way. The reactionary thing that it's much shorter, right? A simunition round only goes about four hundred feet per second, right? It's not all that much faster. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But it it shrinks that down significantly. Yeah, and it hurts so, a hell of a lot more. I haven't done. I'm sure you've done simunition round stuff. Um, it depends. So there's a couple different offerings. There's the simunition. There's a federal force on force round, and then the uh, the UTM rounds. They have different degrees of pain involved. Um, uh, most of my training has been done with uh, federal force on force rounds, and they do hurt. Um, mm-hmm. It's a different kind of hurt as opposed to a um, as opposed to a paintball. Um, a paintball leaves a bigger welt because it's 68 caliber versus a nine millimeter, um, you know. Yeah, no, I get it. What, what I'm trying, what I'm trying to address with people, because I think unfortunately there's things that uh, we've done or seen that maybe there's people out there who haven't done it. I don't think I've done everything, not, not at all. I don't think I've scratched like the surface of 1% of what there is to learn about guns. I probably, by the time I kicked the bucket, I wouldn't have scratched the surface of 5% of what yeah, there and, is to know and about. I would, I would also say the same thing in, in in my regard, even though I've done a lot of training, I'm a perpetual student, right? Mm-hmm. And and I am not the person who thinks that my perspective is the end all be all. That's just not how I operate. I am a student of the gun. I continuously try to extract more knowledge from wherever I can get it. Right. So, but the thing I'm trying to establish that I don't think everyone realizes out there until, you know what, really, I think I would, I would tell people out there, go get training and kick up the level of training that you're doing and, and then think about this in that light. So I'm not, I totally believe that people should be safe and think about what they're doing be very careful pointing guns at people, muzzling people and all of that kind of stuff. You know, I'm, I'm a hundred percent with that. But what I don't think that people see or understand in a lot of cases is what really happens in training and the things that, that you really have to train for if you're training for a real life situation. Most people out there, not all, but a lot of people out there are training for unreal life situations. So, in, in, in just about every experience that I've been in with training that goes, um, that ratchets up over the course of the class, mm-hmm. right? Or over the course of the instruction anyway, there are shutoffs, right? There, mm-hmm. there are points where you will be ratcheted up to the point at which you can no longer perform. And when that safety factor starts to drop off, mm-hmm. the, the training gets cut off until you reach that level, right? Mm-hmm. So in multiple instances, um, I've been in, in courses of instruction where um, someone may be, maybe it's just one individual or maybe it's uh, a small subset of the people who are in the class have not met the standard and either they have been segregated out or, and the whole class has been allowed to advance or Um, the whole class is brought down, right? Mm -hmm. And a proper professionally run class should follow one of those two tenets. Remember, no matter what the training is, and I'm going to choose my words very, very specifically here, pointing real guns at people is not okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Period. Right? Right. If it's a real gun that shoots real bullets, whether it's loaded or not, pointing guns during training at live human beings, remember at, mm-hmm. not at. toward, yes. at. Yeah. People, there's like subtleties to what we're saying. One of the things I think that is, there's a good reason for this. You don't actually see a lot of what happens in these kinds of training classes because typically people are not allowed to record it. Yeah. You know, totally. these, yeah, these guys don't want this kind of stuff out there. But what I'm trying to get across to you guys is that you know, it gets emotional. There's a, there's a level, there's a level of some of these classes where it gets emotional because there's things happening that people are not necessarily prepared to do. And it gets emotional because they're like, wait a second. And if it's really, if it's really that bad, that person obviously shouldn't do it. Right. They shouldn't um, get into these things and go further in this stuff. But what I'm trying to say that there's things that happen 
and uh, that you're training for that people are not even mentally prepared for the things that are happening. And when you come to that point, you realize that if you're not prepared for that, and if you cannot do that, then the real the real world thing you can't do either. And I think that might go back to what you were saying when you that what you said in the video that a lot of people got upset about, you know. And I'm not knocking anyone for getting upset about it, you know. When you were saying that, hey, if you're not um, if you know if you're not up to this, then you probably shouldn't be in guns. Yeah, you know. I think yeah. that's kind of like a facet of what you were talking about there, that there's certain things here. If you really think about the real life situation of what's going to happen to you in your home, someone kicks in the door, you know, it's your house, your family's there, your dog's there, your kids are there, your wife's there, all kinds of crazy things start happening. And you've got to decide in that moment, are you going to fight or are you going to give up? And when you give up, you are totally at the mercy. Your family, all these people you care about are at the mercy of whoever has decided to attack you. And at that point, they can do anything to you. And we all know the horror stories. You know, We all know the things that we're talking about. Um, and you make that decision when you give up. Now, you also make that decision when you decide not to train on that level and even think about what could happen. Or that when you, when you do get out there and start training and you get to that level, and then your emotions take over and you're like, well, fuck that. I'm not doing this or I can't do this. If you if you can't face that, you cannot face what's going to really happen to you in the real world, in real life. 100% correct. I agree with what you said. Um, the other thing that you have to realize as well, um, and this is something that I learned through force on force training, um, is, and this is going to sound kind of bad. I'm just going to brace everybody for that. Um, the act of carrying the firearm, having it with you, can precipitate the situation into something that you may not have wanted it to go to, right? And that sounds very kind of like twisted up in a, something like an anti-gunner would say. Yeah, someone could take that the wrong way. Very Somebody easily. could totally take that the wrong way, but let me clarify, right? If you are... Um, if you are... Um, Say in a, we'll just pick a random situation. Say you're in a bank robbery, right? And you are carrying a firearm, right? Even though you're probably not supposed to carry a gun inside the, the bank, you were going in there that day, you just needed to drop some stuff off, you know, whatever. Somebody comes in, um, tells everybody to get on the ground, right? They've got a gun shoved in your face, right? Everybody, they get everybody down, right? And they start rifling through your pockets and stuff, right? Okay. Well, they start rifling through your pockets and through your, through all of your stuff, they're probably going to find that firearm, right? Mm -hmm. Would that, could they have passed on from you and just taken your wallet and shit and left? Yeah, maybe. Or does it create a shooting at that point in time? Right? That's something that you have to think of. So at some point, you have to take that responsibility of taking your own safety and those around you's safety as your responsibility really becomes yours. And there may be a point where you cannot back out of, right? You may not be able to talk your way out of some things, right? Mm -hmm. There may not be no other escape except through that bullet, right? And you have to be prepared because that shit happens fast. It can happen very fast, mm -hmm. right? And you may not have the time to respond and think about things as thoroughly as maybe some of us sit around and, and think about various things. So the mental conditioning associated with training is something that I think is severely missing from a lot of firearms courses uh, across the country. Yeah. And I'm not saying like, you know, I don't necessarily spend a whole bunch of time thinking about it. I think that's why I go to training. I go to training so that someone else outside of me, you know, uh, makes me think about things and makes me think about what's really going to happen. I'm all I'm hoping my whole entire life, I never get into anything like that. You know, we all do. Yeah. All do. The, the problem for me, like I said, I was never in the military, never in law enforcement. Uh, I grew up in Far Rockaway, New York in the crack 80s. I've been right in the middle of shootouts. I've seen a lot of craziness. I've seen two people shooting at each other from maybe 10 feet away and missing each other. You know, um, and, and hitting other people. If people so, if people don't think that that can't happen. Um, go take a force on force class where bullets are going in two different directions, right? 
yeah. you're sending them and other people are sending them. Right. If you don't think that you can miss from like right up in your face, bad breath distance, right? You're wrong. Yeah. Right. You you can. I've right. seen it. Right. right. Absolutely. And the only the reason why I'm having this conversation because I'm having it with you because I know that you're not afraid of having the conversation. Sometimes, a lot of people are. A lot of people will yeah. stay will stray away from this conversation. Right, absolutely. But I think it's a conversation that needs to be had in my personal opinion. I'm not saying I have answers about it, but I just think that, you know, there's levels of everything that we're doing there. Some of us just like guns, we buy guns, we just enjoy owning them. Going, going to the range, shooting them. We, we enjoy our target practice and getting really good at shooting and hitting the bullseye and all that kind of stuff. Some of us want to shoot long. We, there's all kinds of things that we're doing in this thing. Some people just want to show off that they have nice guns. If though, you are the person who says that I'm doing this for that one day when I have to defend myself or defend others, people that I care about or you know whatever that situation is. If you're really saying that, then really think about it and think about what happens in real life and how crazy and complicated and totally insane that is. And most of the times when things go wrong, it's just like a fight. Uh, I'm sure everyone listening to this has been in a fight before. Like, you know, I'm sure everyone's been in high school, right? How did you wind up in this fight? How did you wind up in this problem? It was a perfect storm. You know, there were things that distracted you. Someone made you mad. This thing's going on. You know, someone cut you off. You had a fight with your wife, your girlfriend. You know, something like that happened to you. And then the same thing happened to the other person. And neither one of you do any, like, the reason why you actually get it when it comes to fisticuffs, right, when blows get thrown, it's that neither one of you thought, like, you know what, this is not, I don't even need to get into this. Excuse me. I'm sorry. That was my bad, right? Neither one of you did that, and all of a sudden now you're in a fight. Maybe even it started as a joke. Maybe you guys were just play fighting. When I grew up, my father oh, my father was actually a fighter, and he, he never let us even play fight with him. If you try to pl play fight with him, he would like do something to you to, to create some pain so that you would realize this wasn't a game. Yeah. So maybe it started out, and the reason why he did it, because he saw really bad things happen to people that started out just play fighting. And then all of a sudden it gets serious. And when it gets serious, it now becomes life and death. And there's a huge difference between you reading someone else's story or looking at someone else's story in a movie, on TV, a reenactment of something, something that happens in the news and you hear about it and you're like, oh, they're stupid. I would have done this. I would have done that thing. And a completely different thing when you just all of a sudden magically one day find yourself that you fell into that hole and you don't even know how the hell you got there. One of the things I spend a lot of time doing um, in addition to training is I read um, a lot of like DA reports of shootings and um, and um, like case studies that have been done on you know various things like that and uh, that's one of the reasons, one of the ways that I extract um, information for use in my perspective on on how I run the guns and how I, you know, would teach somebody to to shoot a gun either through YouTube or you know some of the small training that I do, you know, one on ones and stuff like that um, on the side, you know, um, all of that stuff that I teach is governed by things that have happened already, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of people say experience, right? And somebody who's got gunfighting experience is somebody you should go train with. I don't have it, right? So I have to find another way to obtain it. And the way to, and the way to do that is through information. So I have to study a lot more than somebody who's got 100 gunfights under their belt, right? Yeah. And if those gunfights are with rifles, you know, in, you know, in Afghanistan, you know, is that applicable? You know, have they been able to take that experience and morph it into training that's applicable to you, the civilian CCW holder, right? Cause I've been to training where dudes are super high speed operators, right? And they, you know, kick down doors and blow people up and all that sort of stuff, but they can't shoot a handgun worth a damn. Right. So, yeah. So here's a um, because I've kind of been ignoring people in the chat. Let's get to some of the uh, yeah questions. yeah. Let's get off this one. We've been on yeah, this one. For yeah, a while. absolutely. So Al's, uh, I'm, I think I'm saying this right. I'm probably saying it wrong. Al Servic 
says, uh, question for VSO, um, please, in force and force training, can't it go south fast if someone takes a round to the face, eye, ear, et cetera? <laughs> and he's trying to get Lola to do it. Lola is here. Uh, what do you I mean, Hell yeah, <laughs> it's going to go bad real fast. <laughs> what do you think? Um, so if you are training force, if you are uh, participating in force on force training and you, they are not having you wear proper protective equipment, personal protective equipment, PPE, walk out, ask for your money back and leave period. Um, once every force on force training that I have been to that has been prop that, well, has been properly run. Um, and what I mean by that is once that mask goes on, once you're, once the mask goes on, it never comes off until you're into the safe area, right? Not when the guns are being loaded, none of that stuff, right? When you're loaded, when you're in the space with the guns, the SIM guns, your protective equipment is on, right? Because this stuff can hurt you very, very bad. A sim round will put out your eye, right now, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it and typically they wear the full face mask, right? Because a shot to the face will leave a scar on your face, and we're not really a, you know, we're not out to fuck up people's faces. Yeah, right? I don't think in that kind of stuff like someone's out there trying to aim for your face. I no. think it could happen. You know, and you kind of have to, um, one of the things that I, and I saw this when, when we were doing even the paintball thing is that someone's, people always tell you that, you know, what happens a lot in gunfights and stuff like that? People actually get hit in their hands. Yeah. You get Be shot in the hand quite a lot. Yeah. yeah. So you should definitely wear gloves, but it happens. And I, and I was always like, well, why, why do you get shot in the hands? And then when we did it, it actually happened. We got a lot of hits in the hands because that's what you're looking at. Yeah. You that that nine millimeter hole in the end of the gun gets about that big, right? When somebody's pointing it at you, right? Mm -hmm. So your focus drifts to that, and that's the same thing that happens with trained and untrained people. Typically, your shots will gravitate, if not directly on the hands, towards the hand because that's the first object that you see, right? And that should probably be the option if it's a firearm. That's typically the object that you are reacting to that is giving you the validity to use lethal force in your protection, right? So you're fixated on that gun, and typically those bullets tend to gravitate towards the hand. Yeah, um, and I, I think that's say, what... Go ahead. I would say about 60% of the times I've been shot with a, with a sim round or other force-on-force -force round has been in the hands. Yeah. A screaming skull saloon says, and don't stare at the sun. <laughs> and don't stare. <laughs> <laughs> I was out, uh, I was out fishing during the uh, during the eclipse, and there was a perfectly thick a cloud of perfect thickness that, mm -hmm. with poor eye sunglasses on, we were able to look at the sun. Yeah, uh, Tony Cantrell says uh, a guy from the uh, neighboring agency took a sim round to the eye and lost his eye. Oh, yeah, that sucks. Yeah, wow. that's so. Uh, but yeah. um, I'm wondering why he didn't have. Uh, maybe that was outside of. The, I don't know. You can tell us if that was outside yeah, of the training. Please tell or... us. Yeah, tell us how that happened. Uh, because they, I guarantee you, they were not wearing a uh, a a proper mask. Yeah, Typically, because even even when it's police officers and other agencies, uh, you know, law enforcement agencies training, they've got they still have to have proper protection, right? Or no? Yeah, they. Sh you should not be fucking around with sim guns uh, without. A mask on the yeah. mask is minimum typically when I go to a to a to a class they will tell you you're allowed one layer right mm -hmm. all your skin has to be covered you're allowed one layer so that it doesn't break the skin but it will still give the pain compliance type um, you know uh, response mm -hmm. um, Oh, but, so you can't um, do multiple layers? No, you can't show up and wear car hearts. No, <laughs> yeah, dude. No, this isn't a game. Layers. This isn't a game. You know, you're there to learn, and well, you true. learn okay. through pain, right? Um, uh -huh. So typically, they'll tell you if you're male, they'll tell you to wear a cup, right? Um, you have to wear a mask, and typically all skin covered, right? Yeah. And what I do for my neck is typically I'll wear like a shemog or something like that, just just because it's easy, and it's easy to take on and off. Uh, they do make neck guards, but they're neoprene, and they I have a beard, and 
Nah. It's crazy. And and also the hand thing that we were talking about is the reason why you're supposed to train to do stuff with your with your handgun with uh with your opposite hand that you yeah. normally use, right? Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've been shot in the hand and had to like it will it will incapacitate like if you get shot in the trigger finger, it will incapacitate your trigger finger for a minute or two. Yeah. Right. Like it will hurt real right. bad, right? <laughs> Maybe even swell up, right? Oh, so, yeah, so Tony says that it was agency training. He was behind a barricade, took his glasses off to wipe some sweat, and the round went through a crack in the barricade and got him. Oh, man. Yeah. So, one, why wasn't he wearing a mask when he was in any any place that is not physically separated from the simunition rounds being fired? If it's not physically separated, a barricade doesn't count. Right, I mean, it needs to be a separate room, right, with at least drywall, maybe even block wall, something like that, plywood, whatever, right, completely separate part of the building or room before your mask comes off, right, and glasses are unacceptable, right, um, absolutely unacceptable around sim rounds. Yeah, so uh, Al said uh, now he gets why people wear the next stuff he never got it till just now. <laughs> That's yeah, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, like, I don't. It's not I just don't cool. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't own a Shamog because I because I like want to pretend like I'm like doing. No, I own a Shamog because sim rounds hurt when they hit you in the neck, yeah. right? And you have to remember in your neck, the um, it's very soft tissue, even if it's really muscly there is a, a good chance that if it hits like your, um, your carotid or your jugular vein, that it could break it, right, and cause internal bleeding, right? So that's, some, that's a safety pr provision that we put in. You wear, the sh you wear something around your neck to make sure that you, you don't bust that blood vessel. Right. right, yeah. And I think, Tony, just to follow up on that, he said that was 12 years ago uh, when they treated Sims like paintball. Okay. Right. Yeah. So that, you know, that, go ahead. No, I'm sure that, you know, and, and remember guys, look at how fast all of this stuff has evolved 10 years ago and or 15 years ago, what kind of accessories were available for the AR 15? Right. Yeah. Not, not no. like 12 years ago. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> no. Almost not, right. Right. So you got to think about training the same way. It has evolved significantly since then. So that may have been the norm back then, right? Now, mm -hmm. in 2017, the norm for properly run sim munition training or, or training with force-on-force uh, -force rounds in a force-on-force -force scenario setting is proper protective equipment. Yeah, and probably uh, scenarios like that is what, you know, unfortunately, that's terrible for the guy that loses his vision in that eye, but stuff like that is what also, you know, adds rules and stuff like that to the training, right? Yeah, typically if there's a sign, it's for a reason, mm -hmm. right? So one, one of the things I would say is I know I did something like this and there was this guy there, I think he was a doctor or something like that because he came in a Porsche. <laughs> And uh, Good I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just being I'm just being racist against dudes that drive Porsches. <laughs> but um, yeah, this guy I'm pretty sure was got coked up before we did this thing, and he was bouncing around. He was like really hyper, and you know it was just paintball. But he was doing a lot of crazy shooting, and I would probably avoid stuff like that in the future. Yeah, if somebody's um, if you're if you show up to I mean, adrenaline has strange effects. Right. I kind of consider myself more of an adrenaline kind of junkie kind of guy. I used to do the paintball thing. I scuba dive, you know, that sort like I I'm into that sort of stuff. I get it. Right. I understand the adrenaline as a drug thing. Um, however, it doesn't do that kind of stuff. Right. People can act kind of weird. Right. When they're when mm -hmm. they're, when they're up on adrenaline, they don't act like they're on cocaine. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're in a situation and somebody's acting that way that person's immediately irresponsible and you should probably excuse yourself from the situation or at least bring it to the attention of somebody who can do something about it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In the like, future, I would back out of something like that. But like, let's, let's, well, let's play devil's advocate right that right there for a second. If you paid a thousand dollars and travel clear across the country for a simunition training course, right? A force on force scenario class, right? You got a thousand dollars in tuition 
and your hotel for like the two or three days of the year there and maybe your airfare and stuff like that, you're a couple, a couple grand in the hole, right? If you show up and there's somebody who just did a bump, right? You're, you, you, I would hope that you wouldn't just outright excuse yourself from the training. You would bring it to the attention of the people who are running the class. Yeah, because you just wasted, I know, you just wasted a yeah. lot of your, you know, a lot of your time, money, efforts, and all that kind of stuff. It happens. Right. It happens, though. You know, some people get a little excited getting into those things. And, you know. Let's just say that some schools are better at filtering those out than others. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So let's hit some other questions here because I know we've been going for a while. Sure. Um, I'm not sure. Okay, Lauren Texas question. What do you guys think about using rock salts from a 10 gauge or 12 gauge? Um, if somebody's worth shooting, they're worth metal. <laughs> okay, good one. I don't really, I've never done that, so I don't even know what happens there. I guess um, I got to do that. What so happens what, with the rock salt? The rock salt goes in, right, and it, and it burns the wound right? It's rubbing salt in the wound, right? Type thing, mm -hmm. right? It's a less than lethal thing. Um, you as a, somebody who's discharging a firearm in self-defense, I'm not a lawyer, by the way, just throwing it out there. This is not legal, <laughs> but yeah. it shouldn't be taken as that, right? Um, if you are discharging a firearm in, in a situation where you felt that you needed to, to shoot somebody, um, you should use the real thing. Right, because what that then can be said, what can then be said is that you didn't really fear for your life. So why did you why did you maim this person, so to speak? Right, um, using a twelve gauge, double lot, period. Right. Okay. People shot with shotguns die now. Right. People shot with pistols run away or die later. Right. Mm -hmm. So. If you're if you've if you've gotten to the point where you're using a shotgun, it's for real, right? Mm -hmm. So, pick the load that is going to give you the performance that you need as somebody who's defending themselves, right? So, and and how I would tell you to do that is what is the longest hallway in your in your house, right? Mm -hmm. And most people, most people, it, it's even even the rich people that I know that would defend themselves with a shotgun, right? Double lot would be fully sufficient inside the home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'll go with that. Do the antis report you often? That's from Al. Um, no, not really. Right. Um, I don't really have that problem a whole lot. I'm sure I'll probably get a whole lot of it now, but like I said, <laughs> um, you know, I have an MCN that handles it for me, right? right. So um, I get a report that says, hey, this was done or that was done, right? And it's less frequent than you would think, right? Um, and even, like, I know that Tim from Military Arms Channel, like, he he must just, like, I don't <laughs> poor guy, man. I mean, some, dudes, some dudes just have people who really <laughs> just get excited yeah, that, and they get got, shut down. He's got people that, like, go after him. Right. And like, I feel bad for him. I don't have that problem every once in a while. Um, there'll be a user here or there that'll go on a spree. And usually, you know, they're got a chip on their shoulder for something. But typically, the anti gun people, you know, they don't really show up a whole lot. I've banned a lot of them. Yeah, so. I don't know if we're, I mean, I obviously, you know, when you, if you listen to what's going on out there, it's, it feels like Bloomberg's paying people to mess with us, maybe troll us and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, due to the anonymity of all this stuff that we're doing, you don't really know who's doing that. Like, um, some of those things could just be other YouTubers. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I think that's it. Sometimes yeah. I think it's Hank back there. He's pissed at yeah. me about something I did. He's just fucking yeah. with my videos on the backside. Yeah, right? just come up. I, I'm, I, I guarantee you there's other YouTubers. I don't have time for that shit. But I guarantee no. you there's dudes that have like 10, 20 different YouTube accounts. And they just oh, yeah. go after people and, you know, try to discourage them or whatever. You have all kinds of stuff happening. So I think that your our enemies are not just the anti-gun people. Sometimes our enemies are our own selves or our um, own people in the gun community, et cetera. I agree. Um, there's um, there's a lot of sub communities within the within the um, within the gun community, so to speak. And um, they a interact with each other much differently. Um the AR people, 
are pretty much buddies. You know, AR, AR companies, they, for the most part, get along and, and people who may have different, diff, or different perspectives on different brands of ARs, they pretty much get along in this day and age. It used to not always be that way. The AK family people hate each other, right? And trainers, right? The training community, it's vicious, um, mm -hmm. in, in those circles. And, um, it's very, very political. And I typically just try to stay out of all of it. <laughs> yeah. So Smeggy 42 is here. He's from gun channels. Quick shout out to gun channels. <laughs> um, so Smeggy says that, um, the daily gun show gets hit by a troll with tons of clone accounts. So you ban one, he just comes back with a different name. So yeah, ban that's the again. thing. Yeah, that's the thing about the internet. Yeah, you just got to keep banning. So that happens all the time. Okay, so I don't know who um, is this uh, Tango, Tango Hunter. Okay, uh, red dot or low powered variable optic, which you guys prefer? Um, in what context? Ask him that. Yeah. Um, so. so if he's still here, which hopefully he's still here, tell us in what context you were talking about. And we'll try to cover that. Um, so, in context, in terms, you want to know what gun, what you're using that gun for, yeah. Et so, cetera, is right? it a is it a home defense rifle, or is it a, you know, is it a rifle that we're going to shoot six hundred yards with? Yeah. Right. See, that's yeah, that's the whole difference, right? Right. So, um, and to preface that, um, <clears throat> and I don't know if this is prevalent or not. I think he says context of if you could ha only have one to do it all. So if you're only red going dot. with one gun, red dot, red dot, a quality red dot, three MOA or less in the dot, right? We'll get you, we'll get you done. Yeah. Um, because when I think about that, what I think of is what's the most important. The most important is things that you can't take back. And that is, Somebody kicks your door in, and that's all you got, right? So self defense trumps all. So yeah, and what and what length of you know what distance are most of us going to get into these things with? Um, right. Well, even then, even if you take it all the way to like Red Dawn shit, right? Mm -hmm. I personally can shoot an AK forty seven with a Red Dot four hundred yards, right? AR fifteen, same, even easier, right? There's less you know, holdover and stuff like that that has to happen with the AR-15 because there's a flatter shooter shooting bullet, right? Mm -hmm. Try to convince the court that you needed to shoot someone at 400 yards. Yeah. <laughs> if this is not a, a like shit hit the fan situation, <laughs> right. if there's actually courts, if there's actually repercussions to what right. you're going to do, you're going to be in a very short distance. And now I don't know wh what you think about this, but I was talking to a SWAT guy that um, that was doing training, and he was saying that they um, they zero their stuff at like real short distances, man, like 10, 12 yards. Uh, yeah, and that's legitimate. It depends on the length of the gun, too, right? So like the, SBRs. The thing, yeah. Well, the thing, like for instance, this gun right here is a short barrel rifle, right? And I have a full video on this if anybody wants to know. But this is a 10.5 inch gun. Wait, hold on. Let me lock you in. What is that? What is? Is this your personal build? Yeah, this is a personal build. I have a full video out on this thing. You'll notice it has a red dot on top of it. Um, it started out just for fun with an ACOG on it. But you have to realize that as a self defense tool or uh, or any of that sort of stuff, the barrier that you really want to stay on is about 2,600 feet per second for a 5.56 round, right? So that this is good out to about about 200 yards and it will still produce that kind of velocity right so what we're looking for is catastrophic breakup of the jacket all the terminal ballistic effects that we want on target and this will provide it now it provides it in a shorter package than your full ar right if you're shooting and that's where the the difference between rifle and short barrel rifle comes in if you're shooting past those kind of distances out to like 400 yards 600 yards you need longer barrel more velocity to push that envelope to still pr provide those terminal ballistics that's why you see all the high speed operator dudes running around with short little things like this because they're shooting people inside of mud huts right yeah and, and so that's why you that's why those guys are like zeroing at 10 12 yards
Yeah, yeah, right. because you have to remember when you've got, if I'm just, you know, this is going to look weird, right? Yeah. If I do but, this, look at the height of that optic over the bore, right? This over where the center of the bore is, the center of the optic over the center of the bore. If you're standing at super close range, like 10, 12 yards or something like that, or even closer, and you throw that gun up and fire around, walk up to the target and put the muzzle mm -hmm. on on the hole and put the optic where you aimed, they'll be about where they were because that bullet has not risen to where the optic was yet. See mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So you have yeah. to compensate for that um, because you have to remember that this isn't a laser that comes out of the end of the gun. It's an arcing projectile, right? Yeah. And that's something that we have to account for on this optic. So if you're super close, you have to yeah. zero your optic or at least know the holdover for it. Yeah, because when when I was when I was looking at him training, he was chewing out these guys because the first thing he said was, "What's your optic uh, zeroed at?" And someone was like, 50, 100. and he was like, "That's crazy. You know, you're not you're going into houses and things like that. These are very short distances, you know, and and you need to be ridiculously accurate in those in those distances." So. Um, yeah, <laughs> that yeah, was funny seeing those guys getting chewed out. <laughs> yeah, if you're if you're if you're a SWAT dude, yeah, your optic you should be you should be like super close, like twenty five yards max, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because think about it. Even if you're raiding a mansion, right? Like think okay, how far think, are the walls in the you know? Uh, how far are the walls are in there? But you have to think it. It gets a little bit more complicated because you have to think about. Like when we're talking about like a CCW person or a self defense person at home, like we have the distance of the of the hallway in our house, right? But if you're a SWAT guy, you might be raiding an industrial building, mm -hmm. right? So now those ranges change a little bit, right? So it's it's mission specific at that point yeah. in time. Yeah, so Schmeggy says that. Right, Schmeggy says that's why fifty yards is good because at worst it's only a few inches up or down. Uh, yes. What do you zero at fifty? Uh, with that, like that SBR that you have, what would you? This one. Yeah. This one is danger close. Okay. Like this, this I use a fifteen meter zero on this, on okay. this gun. Fifteen okay. meter zero on this gun, but right. that is a short barrel rifle, ten point five inches, right? Not what I zero my full length carbines at. This gun, if I can find it, right here we go. This is a Midwest gun, right? It actually does have a, a variable power optic on it because I'm reviewing it right now. Uh, this is the new Nikon offering, the okay. Black Force 1000. Um, this is a 16-inch gun. This gun gets zeroed at 50 yards. Okay, 50. Okay. 50, right? Yeah. It, 50 yards gives you the best ballistic performance um, bar none. Right? Yeah. That is the proper zero for a 5.56 gun, 16 inches or longer. Yeah, right? so now my friend, my friend, I'm just prefacing this, it's my friend, the Tyvon Show. He says he calls BS, he says he knows guys that shoot uh, 400 to 600 yards all day with a 16 inch barrel with an AR. Um, yeah, I mean, okay, I understand oh, yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. 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 But you know, I'm what kind of optics do they, yeah, that's I'm absolutely reasonable. I'm not calling that into question. I can do that with a red dot. Yeah. The 16 inch barrel. Yes. Yeah. Duh. Yeah. That's that's easy. Marines have to qualify at 600 yards with a 20 inch barrel with iron sights. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Exactly. So uh, I'm totally are you, capable of doing it. Right. Yeah. How are you doing on time? Because I know we're running kind of long. We're approaching like three. You're good. Okay. Because yeah. I, I want to get to a bunch of different questions before we wrap this up. Um, you know, also like, what do you think about? Um, I saw there's um, Primary Arms has this AC. Well, no, not Primary Arms. Hollow Sun has an ACSS red dot. So it's a, it's a, it's a reticle. You know, basically, and um, you can you know the ACSS, like the, with the bullet drop compensation and all that. And I shot with that thing with a magnifier. I shot at 600 yards. Um, so it's, I'm not familiar with the optic, but mm -hmm. I'll give you my perspective on it um, from the things that you've told me. One, is the reticle etched? Yes. If the reticle is etched. Okay. Um, the biggest problem I see with a magnifier is it. Ma people don't realize it magnifies everything. Okay, 
Now, if the reticle is etched, that's fine, right? Because if the reticle is etched into the glass, then that's just like having a second focal plane scope, mm -hmm. right? Where you turn the thing and the reticle magnifies with the, I think I got that right. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure second, yeah. The difference between second and second and first. I, I did a whole video um, on this. Yeah, uh, second. My brain's a little tired right now, so I'm, I'm not Yeah, sure you got to figure out like where that thing is. Is it behind or in front of? <laughs> yeah, it's a second focal plane scope. It's a right. second focal plane scope. Yeah, right. I, I said it right, right. Mm -hmm. But it's the exact same thing, right? But when you're talking about a red dot only, so a mm -hmm. projected, either a, um, a holographic or a projected dot, um, like is just on top of that SBR that I threw up there. Um, Different it story. It, it makes everything bigger, right? Yeah. So it makes the target better and it makes the reticle bigger, right? So if you have a three MOA dot and you add a three times magnifier, now you have a nine MOA dot that you're aiming with on a target. Remember, magnification does not make you a better shooter. It allows you to see the target better. Yeah. Right. Now, so here's the thing with that. I, I mean, because I want to make sure I got to check into it. But this is like like the um, the hollow sun one is the size of a red dot, but it has that ACSS reticle on it. So that's yeah. why that's why I'm saying that I think it's etched. We have to check into it. We don't know. I could get the professionals who know better to come on and tell us. But yeah, I think that's what the difference is. It's like a red dot sized optic but it has that ACSS reticle, you know, cause obviously that, that can't be a dot, you know, yeah. that can't be projected. That would be etched. I don't know if you well, guys have seen be, it. It could be projected. I've seen them projected oh, yeah. before, okay. Um, yeah. but they suck. Right. So if it's a non etched projected ACSS, I'm saying, nah. Oh, okay. Right. Well, yeah. I'm assuming because I was like hitting all day. There's actually video of this, of me out in like in the desert with the guy that designed it and I'm shooting like 600 yards, 300 and 600. I would so, say that if you're getting that kind of performance out of it, it almost has to be an etched reticle. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. but, you know. But the reason why I brought that up is just in case the person who asked that question, like, you know, if they're looking for that kind of like, you know, that funny mix where they can get something like that, that they can slap on that, you know, they could take off that, that uh, or, you know, you can get a mount for the magnifier that you could flip out of the way. Yeah. And then you can just use it you know, like a regular red dot, quote unquote. And then if you need to go a little bit of distance, you could flip it on if you've only got one rifle and you're trying to do something for it. Right. And I, I agree with that. The, uh, the, the, one of the major things that comes into um, perspective for me um, is weight, uh, especially if you're out there training with the thing for hours upon end, um, weight becomes a problem. Um, that's one of the reasons I tell people more towards the red dot as well is because red dots are typically light. Once you, uh, once you add the variable power, yeah, like this, it gets heavier. Or, um, also, we've got um, Robert McNeely wants to know what's the make and the power of that scope you just showed. I think you said Nikon, but which one is it? It's the Nikon Black Force One. Can you just show it? Yeah, can you just show yeah, it? Yeah. In screen demon. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got a video coming up on this, or you released it already? Uh, I have not released it yet. I have not. Um, I've started filming it. Whenever I test an optic, so a lot of. A lot of guys will just take guns out and te and just film them. Yeah. Uh, I'm not that way. Right? Yeah. And I, this uh, is and, and like this is the test. We just we're shooting it right now. It's awesome. No, no, no. It takes months <laughs> to do. It. Yeah, Especially I know because like, I've been testing stuff for a while, and people there's people like, well, what's going on here? Just make a video. No, I've been shooting this no. thing for yeah. for like a year. So you know, like, and I've been showing it in videos that I'm shooting it, but like me actually saying what I think about it, that takes time. Yeah, a gun is a little bit easier because you can go with round count on a gun, right? Like I can say, oh, I'm going to shoot a thousand rounds through this gun, say if it's good or not, right? Most problems will present themselves in a thousand or two thousand rounds on a gun, right? Yeah. Or a part, right? On a scope, you have to shoot way more rounds through a scope, right? Yeah. Before you understand these idiosyncrasies. This is a Nikon Black X, our Black Force 1000. This is like their competition variable power scope, right? Uh, um, there will be a full video out on it when I complete it. But again, guys, I thoroughly test scopes before I do anything because... Oh, so um, the magnification is from what to what? One to four. One to four. And okay. this has... Um, it has a multifaceted reticle. It has bull drop compensation in it, uh, set up for the 5.56 round, as well as the... Have you seen the horseshoe rings um, that yes. some optics have? It has yeah. the horseshoe rings and then dots. 
in the center of those for um, for hold up for um, I'm not actually allowed to say what the dots are for, oh. <laughs> but they're uh, okay. the engineer told me what they're for. But the official is a wind of sufficient power at <laughs> yeah. So it's so, a, okay. Well, so hold on, this is me saying this. So it's like a wind holdover, right? Yeah, it's a kind of it's thing. a wind correction. Right. right. Okay. All right. I'll tell you. I'll tell you afterwards what it actually. Okay. Is. So but, let me just get a couple of things here. Um, um, so Mike Bryant wants to know. I don't know if he's talking about what we were like the optic I was talking about. He wants to know if it's etched. He really needs an etched solution he can afford. Um, so go look at um, uh, hollow. Look up Hollow Sun ACSS. Um, I think it's Hollow Sun ACSS Red Dot or something like that. Look it up. If not, I'll try to look into it and find out what's going on. Um, let me if see here. If he's looking here. for a variable power optic, this thing is pretty good, right? Okay. So, and this is affordable too. So, um, it's not super expensive. I don't right. recall the price off the top of my head, but it's not outrageous. So, right. Okay. Um, Al Cervix says, uh, "Please tell VSO thanks. He learned a lot tonight. Great show. Uh, you're a humble and smart guy. He appreciates it." So. Well, I appreciate you, man. I, I I appreciate you watching and 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 doing all that and saying all that stuff and and you know, hopefully yeah, so we'll draw you over to our side and you know you can yeah. See so Lola's telling me it's Al Chervik. Is that right, Lola? Rodney Dangerfield's character. In oh, Rodney Dangerfield's character and oh, and Caddyshack. Oh, I should have got. Oh that. man, <laughs> damn it! Why get, did uh, I not get that? I feel so uh, stupid now. <laughs> nah, I okay. got it. And um, him and a lot, lots of other guys, uh, Tango Hunter, they all want to have you come back. You, you know that you know you know you're welcome to come on, man, and talk with me anytime, right? Well, I always I I used to do this sort of stuff all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And I just kind of fell off uh, because I got really busy and you know some other reasons as well. But I um I really do enjoy doing this kind of stuff because I don't get to talk to my real friends like in the industry very mm -hmm. often. Right. I'm yeah. usually out on the range doing. Yeah. What I do and this is what we do when we hang out. If you, you might not believe it, but the last time I saw you, you were just hanging out. For, remember that we were hanging out for hours. I think it was like three, four o'clock in the morning and Lola was pissed. <laughs> yeah, it was. It's, it's a stream of consciousness uh, conversation. It goes from yeah. one thing to the yeah. other. constantly. Yeah, Lola, because we were like camping out on um, Iraq veterans property. And I don't know if you camped out or you left and drove. No, I drove. I drove back to Atlanta <laughs> and went to the show the next day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. You had to go back to the NRA show. Lola and I, we had a t like a tent on top of our Forerunner, and it was flipped down. And she didn't want to go to the tent. And me and you were just talking. She was like, "That's it," and she left us. So we do this all the time, just so you guys know. But you are welcome back. Um, and Tango Hunter wanted to know how's the RAS AK forty seven holding up. So we just published our second test, uh, our, our excuse me, our second milestone on it. We've been doing 5,000 rounds on the thing. Um, they've made, just so everybody understands why the reason we're doing this, um, they've made some changes to the gun over the course of the last couple of years, and we thought, you know, we would try it and see how it goes. So far, it's doing all right. It's doing fine. Um, there's, I haven't seen anything that I classify as catastrophic failure at this point in time. Right. How many rounds did you said you guys put through it? Uh, right now we're at 2000. 2000. So, okay. Yeah. What we do is we shoot it, um, we clean it and then we photograph it so that it's, you know, there's, it's not obscured by dirt or anything like that, uh, from shooting it. This last round that we did was about 75% suppressed, uh, on the gun. Um, so 75% of 2000 rounds or of a thousand rounds, it's about 750 rounds of that, that next thousand was shot suppressed. Um, wow. Okay. That's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. So, you know. um, and you know, we have seen metal movement okay. in the bolt, which is something we expect to see, but what the way we're running the test is we want the users, the, the viewers to do the analysis for us. Right. Okay. So they can, they can tell me what's important. Right. So what I look for, though, is progression of wear. So we know that the AK, any AK out there, is going to wear on the parts. It's metal. Right? I mean, it's, it's metal. Yeah, mechanical it's metal. Thing. Yeah. It's going to happen, right? Um, but what I'm looking for is progressive wear. Does it continuously get worse? And that's what I'm 
one of the reasons I'm doing it is so that you guys will, will, will do the analysis and the other one is so I can catalog that gun, right? Because I can go back and look at the very end, right? At each individual piece and say, oh, well, that looks worse there, but it stopped there, you know, like that sort of thing. So Yeah. Okay. And I think there was a question about the uh, LWRC Reaper. That's going to be like the second to last thing that we hit. We've got like 52 people in here right now, man. Believe it or not, that's pretty badass. <laughs> so I, this fifth, like we're in a party right now. This is a big party. Well, <laughs> I, I have people and us. <laughs> well, I've had a good time here, so yeah. I, I, I enjoy it. So. That's freaking awesome! Shout out to everyone that's hanging out with us, with us in here right now. Make sure you click the like button and share this, even though we're about to be out. But so yeah, <laughs> what do you think about the LWRC Reaper? Um, I've not shot it, so I can't say anything about it, actually. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I actually own one, and I have okay. shot it. It's a very nice gun. Really expensive. <laughs> LWRC. Yeah, it's LWRC, but it's expensive with a reason, <laughs> because there's a lot of really cool stuff in there. So um, I like it. I probably need to bring it out and do some more videos, but I haven't done, like, you know, I haven't shot a crap ton. It's 308, so. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not putting not five, yeah, I'm not putting 5,000 rounds through it or anything like that, but I like it. It's a, it's a pretty cool gun. And then the, the last thing that we should talk about real quick here is YouTube, right? We promised people we would talk about the whole YouTube thing. Oh, yeah. How are you guys dealing with YouTube? Is YouTube shutting down your videos? Um, so they, I put out a video on the new thing that they've got going on with the, uh, with the, the monetization stuff. Um, guys, the way we've kind of built our business around YouTube um, – it was never really a big factor for us. Um, it never even came close to paying the ammo bill that we expend around here, right? So uh, I touched earlier, we have a dual facet business. We do the um, the video thing that you guys see, obviously. And then a lot of the stuff that you don't see behind the scenes is the testing and evaluation of, um, and really a consulting arm of the company. And, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of, there's a lot of different revenue streams that come in to make, you know, Do you have our sponsors? I think someone was asking about that earlier. Like, um, like we actually Northern. sponsors is not something that we really um, accept because it's a, it's a um, it's an integrity thing. Mm -hmm. um, any any like any any banner that you see anywhere or something like that is directly related to work um, that we're doing. So um, we don't accept money uh, from companies. They're just like, hey say good things about us, take this money, right? We, we don't, that's not something that we do. So um, it might be a media contract that we have, or it might be a testing and evaluation, a field testing contract that we have with a company or something like that. Okay, so um, it's how that, you word it. It's how it's worded, but, and, that, and how you execute it. Well, yeah, and, but that's really important though, because that's yeah. an integrity thing. Right. right. Absolutely. So, I mean, I have sponsors, but what I do is tell everyone, hey, these people sponsor me. So I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, telling well, you suppose. to. Huh? I suppose. Yeah, I suppose yeah. there's nothing wrong with that as well. Um, so, yeah. No, yeah. I'm not trying to defend it. I'm just saying that, you know, I think that people should be very, I try to be very open about what's going on with my channel with people. I know some people mm -hmm. don't and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, and we all have different things that we're doing and ways that we look with, at it and we have different rules for how we do stuff. I think there yeah. are people, like the people who sponsor me, what people don't realize is like we have a few people that sponsor us and we make videos and I always tell people, hey, these guys sponsor us. But the money helps us to, because like you just said, man, um, the, whatever money is coming from YouTube does not pay for the ammo that we go through. No, not probably even spend, close. Yeah, not we probably close. spend at least 10 times more than that on ammo. So the guys that do sponsor me, it's not really the stuff that I do for them. That them sponsoring me allows me to like buy this gun that that people are like, "Oh, what do you think, you know, what do you think about this gun?" And and do all those kinds of things. So they're actually allowing other things for you to see other stuff on my channel. I don't do stuff just for the people that sponsor me. So I suppose a really good example of um, if I'm going along those lines, a, a good example of like a company that would we would consider a, I suppose by that definition, a sponsor um, would be like the ammo providers. Like uh, we work with Fioki and Freedom mm -hmm. uh, Munitions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Fioki of America and Freedom Munitions um, mm -hmm. and help us by supplying a, a, a serious chunk of the ammunition that, uh, uh, that you see. Um, right. So, um, now that's not that's literally 
covers a fraction of the ammo that we shoot, right? right. So, and it doesn't just take, I mean, ammo is really important in this. I'm, I'm telling yeah. you, you can burn through ammo really quick, just making a video. Right. I make one video and I shoot more than the, per, than the average person, not everyone, but the average person in that one video that's gonna go out and buy that gun before yeah. they sell that gun that they bought. Yeah. So now, and that that takes money, but that's not the whole thing of making a video. It's camera equipment, location, there's people there, there's the guns, right. there's a whole bunch of other, whatever you're shooting at, all that stuff, right? But like a, a good example, okay, let me let me give a let me give a breakdown. Let me be completely transparent for something. Say for instance a company sends us a rifle that they want us to test. Um, and the test protocol calls for 1500 rounds to go through that gun, right? Um, so we're going to you know have a rate that's derived from hours and all that and man man hours and all that sort of stuff to perform this field testing and give them a full report on that gun and the and some video that's associated with it so that they can actually see the physical testing that's going on right so there's that and then there's the expense side of things right mm -hmm. so if i have to shoot 1500 rounds through it right well either that has to be reflected in the rate that I charge to do the to do. Oh, the they've got to pay for that. <laughs> or they have to supply the ammo. One of the two. Yeah. And right. it, and by the way, I don't know if I said this, but that's a really good uh, service that you're offering because a lot of companies are not testing stuff they put out there. I'm always telling companies you need to find someone. There's lots of gun guys have ranges and they're doing this stuff. You need to get them, send these guns to them, let them test it. Now the people on the YouTube side that are watching videos don't necessarily get to benefit from that immediately because you probably have an NDA. You've got to give them all this data and all that kind of stuff with the gun. If, yep. But they do benefit from it later on when you're allowed to talk about it and the experience you get. But also you find things that you can help that company correct those problems before those guns go out. And um, we, our slogan at the bottom of, of the, uh, of the page here that you can see like right, right down here is bend the fit, scratch the finish, right? Mm -hmm. And we do that to every single gun. Um, in our contract that we send our terms of service to anybody who's doing any testing, it literally says that we are not responsible for your gun returning functional or whole. That is a direct quote from the thing because we've had companies who they've sent us guns for testing and we're like, Hey, we broke your gun. Sorry about it. It's back in the mail. Fix it. No. Right? <laughs> yeah. um, and that's a problem. Like, what? And, you and, broke it? <laughs> yeah. And they're like, what? It's broken. What What did you do? Oh, I drug it behind a truck. What? Well, hey, did you read the test protocol that we said that we were going to do? Like, so there's some companies that, that want various things from you, right? There's a difference between people who actually want their, their gun tested, and then there's people who want... Um, other things from you. So, yeah. Um, now, so I don't know. Someone's at, right. Someone's asking about Sentry Arms. I don't know. Do you have some kind of thing with Sentry Arms? Do you have, like, one way or the other, any kind of agreement, deal, disagreement? <laughs> um, we have a, we have a, an agreement with Sentry Arms. We do field testing for their equipment. Yeah. Right. So, one of, right. One of the things I want to say to people, I don't know if you guys realize this, because a lot of, and you can tell me whether you think this is uh, wrong or right, Curtis, lots of YouTube gun channels, it's like I see it this, in the same light that I see wrestling, like WWF or WWE, whatever you want to call it. There's lots of people doing things like pretending to you that they own these guns or whatever, and they don't. There's no. a lot of bullshit going on. So I, I think you should give like some kind of credibility, some kind of respect for someone who's trying to tell you what's going on. You know, because yeah, I so, think there's lots of people who are just totally faking the funk. I'm not knocking it, but people just don't realize that because they don't know how to separate what's happening. Yeah, Understandably so, so. We we um a, a good example. Um so there are there are two firearms here from Century right now that are here for field testing, right? And I hope that I will have one of them done soon. We've had it for a little while, right? I'm hoping that we'll be able to make a video on it that's completely unrelated to the testing, by the way. Um, okay. But while the gun's here, right, it's something that we want to tell you guys about because it's, it's new, or at least it's a revamp of something new, right? Or okay. something old, right? 
So we will probably, if you look at it from a business side of, side of things, I, I'm in this business, I got started in this business because of YouTube and I'm in this business and I have to make YouTube videos on stuff to keep people interested. It's like a like monster. It's a, it's, a, it's a big, nasty monster that just keeps going back on itself. You have to right? keep feeding it. <laughs> I have to keep feeding it. So if I've got a gun here that is here for a for field testing, right? X number of rounds, you know, suppressed, X number of rounds unsuppressed, these mags, that thing, you know, all that stuff, right? Fit and finish and parts test like all that sort of stuff, right? If we're here for that, right? then why not turn the damn camera on and make a YouTube video out of it for my audience that wants to know about AKs. Right. Right? Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Now, yeah. Now, in that, in, that, in that, one of the perks of that, right, for instance, is if they make something that I think would be a really cool YouTube video, then I can request it, right? So, if you're a Patreon viewer, right? If you're one of our supporters on Patreon, at seven o'clock, about three hours ago, a first look was published over on Patreon for you guys to see. The only people who can see it are the are the people who are at the at the level two perk over there that um that can see the exclusives, right? That gun was one of the guns that I was like, I want to I just want to shoot that gun, right? I don't even care, right? I just want to shoot that gun because it looks fun. It looks fun, right? Yeah. And so that's what I did. Right. Yeah. I was like, I want one of those so that we can shoot a bunch uh, of it for video. Right. Yeah. And the, and that's cool. So I'm glad you brought up Patreon because I was going to ask you if you're on Patreon. But Vanessa Kitty, um, you know, she wants to know what Patreon is. Do you want to explain that? We also have a Patreon. We're Patreon slash Hank Strange. What's your Patreon? So our, ours is VSO Gun Channel. Um, slash okay. VSO Gun Channel. And uh, we do a couple different things with Patreon. Um, it started way before the YouTube shenanigans started uh, with the monetization and stuff like that. Um, and we actually started it um, for our giveaways. Um, giveaways got just too, just too much to handle uh, over here. So what we decided to do was winnow the, uh, the pool down by making it Patreon. And some of them we don't even announce. We just have extra stuff that we just pick somebody and send it out to them, right? Um, something like that. We do have announced ones. Like we're giving away a 50 cal at the end of the year. Um, we have a series going on called 50 cal Friday. We take a 50 cal out. Tomorrow's 50 cal Friday, by the way. Oh, cool. Um, okay. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, Gotta we'll, tune in for that. Yeah, yeah. We'll have a 50 cal Friday video tomorrow. But uh, we take we take the 50 cal out and blow something up with it or something along the line, something 50 cal related with it. At the end of the year, uh, after the series is complete, we'll be giving that away to one of our Patreon viewers, right? right. And it comes with the scope, the base, and the rifle. It's like a five or $4,500 value or something yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a big deal, to right? To say it, the least. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the biggest giveaway we've ever done, right? Uh, stuff like that happens. So that's like to get into that one. That's one. That's one level. That's like the base level, right? Um, you're just automatically entered in every, everything. The other Patreon level that we have currently, we're probably going to add some more, but is uh, exclusive content. So anything that we do that's um, that just really wouldn't fit in the either the production schedule or the um, or the publishing schedule. Or maybe it's maybe it's a first look, or maybe it's a really bad blooper reel, or something like that, or you know something like that that just wouldn't generally be published on something else that we were that we were running. It will be published on Patreon. Okay. So, Did we explain what it was though? Because basically, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I failed. No, that's cool. No, go ahead. Okay. So make yeah. up for it. Explain to. Um, okay. To Patreon is, is a is a site that allows you to contribute directly to uh, the creator. So. Um, with the shenanigans is going on with YouTube, it is another means of subsidizing the uh, content that you um, that you like to watch. So, um, creators offer various levels of perks for various things. So, if you give two dollars here, you might get this perk. If you give you know ten dollars a month here, you know you might get something else, right? So, um, it's very individualized for the the creator and the audience. So, um, yeah, it's a good our, way. Of, go ahead. Our content, our normal content that we produce two videos a week or more will never be pay for play, right? But 
there's a bunch of other stuff that we do, right? Like maybe cuts from some of that testing that we were talking about, um, that sort of stuff that may find its way over to Patreon um, for people who just care to see it. You know, if you can deal with listening to me for an extra few minutes a week, and that's something you want to you want to do, then yeah, over there, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, it's a good it's a good place to. Uh, it, basically, it's something that was set up so that people could support the content creators in lots of different facets, not just gun guys, but all across the board. Um, because YouTube and, and all these other things, obviously out there, as they're getting bigger, you know, they're not, they're, the, whole, the whole model that they're changing to isn't really gonna go to dealing with the content creators. Their whole system is really like a pyramid kind of thing. We're all creating the content, they're making the money off of it from advertising, but they're changing that. So for lots of different reasons, we're losing whatever uh, funding was coming from that. And it does cost money just to put this on. And then in the case of people who are doing this singularly, they don't have another job. And I don't care, even if they have a job, they're creating content to entertain you. You know, if you're, you're not watching cable, if, you know, if you're watching cable, you're paying for that. If you're watching TV with ads, you're paying for it. Whatever you're, if you're watching YouTube, you're paying for it if you're seeing ads. If you're watching YouTube and you're blocking the ads, well, okay. Someone, you're a prick. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're kind of, you know, you're kind of fucked up, to be honest with you. But I get it. You know, it's the world that we live in. But it's a way. But you know, it takes something for people to do this. So if you imagine like YouTube, kind of like as that subway in New York City or any other place, and there's people in that subway that are making music or doing comedy or somehow entertaining your ass, you know, um, Patreon is a way of just going, hey, you know, here's some change. Thanks for for uh, looking out for us. And as Lola is reminding me here, she says like every dollar that someone pledges for us or for a VSO gun channel and Patreon, it's more than, than we make on YouTube. You know what it takes to actually make a buck? Yeah. <laughs> so YouTube? Yeah, a lot. A it's lot insane. from Yeah, people yeah. think like, uh, you probably have way more than this because you know, you've been doing this a lot longer, you're a lot bigger, but we're approaching 10 million views. I don't have a dollar for every one of those views. <laughs> No, I don't have no, I don't I don't, I don't have a penny for every one of those views. I you know wish what I, mean? I yeah. wish I had a dollar for every view that I've gotten. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't remember what we're at or I think we're like 26 million or something like that. I don't I don't remember. Uh, I haven't checked in a while, but. Um, dude, if I had that, <laughs> what would I be doing? Right. Know, if it right? was that lucrative. Right. It's not. You'd be doing some damn Bilzerian shit. I know you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> shooting, shooting drones. I can barely keep the drone I have flying, right? Yeah. Just shooting them with can cannons and shit. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's batshit crazy. Okay, you know what? Listen, we probably should wrap this up. There's lots of people that have been hanging in there with us for, for hours and stuff like that. But you know what? I really I really appreciate you coming on. We I are appreciate genuine. you inviting me. Oh, you're, you're welcome, man. We genuinely are friends. You are invited to come on again. I will reach out to you. But, you know, if you've got something you want to talk about or some crazy shit is going down, you know, let's say there's something going on crazy in the news. Can we can we call you up? Because we didn't even talk about the SIG P320. Yeah. <laughs> at, at any time, if you need a guest, you can call me up and uh, and I will do my best to make it a priority. Yeah, so. absolutely. Okay, thanks, man. So we will do that. Anything um, that you want to plug before I wrap up? Hey, just check us out. Uh, VSO Gun Channel everywhere. Uh, we're on YouTube, full30.com, very important. Facebook, Instagram, Patreon, you know, just about everywhere you can find us will be VSO Gun Channel. And uh, we really appreciate you guys' support. Um, we try our best to make our content, you know, uh, informative and fun to watch, as well as, uh, you know, well produced. Uh, I produce it all myself. Uh, I'm the editor and the filming guy most of the time. So I have a bunch of guys that help me out. Um, and, uh, I basically pay them in guns. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it's probably illegal in some way, shape, or form. Um, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> you didn't say that. My dedicated NSA agent will probably call me later. But um, but anyway, I really appreciate you guys. You guys have been uh, awesome to uh, to interact with here tonight, and uh, we hope to see you guys over on the VSO Gun Channel. Absolutely. So I know if you guys aren't subscribed to VSO, you really should be. I know that uh, he's not always everyone's cup of tea. Sometimes he rubs people the wrong way. But I can tell you from knowing him and all this time, he's a genuine, real dude. And, uh, you know, because he's like all big and, you know, 
and tough looking with the beard and all that. And sometimes, sometimes just that alone pushes people's buttons, Curtis. <laughs> well, can I interject two things there? Yeah. One, the beard. Right now it's short because it's hot outside. It gets uh -huh. cold here in the winter, right? And I don't stop testing and I don't stop filming just because it's cold outside. February here really sucks, right? Yeah. So and you're not doing this just to be tactical looking. No, no. It's cold here. Um, like cold enough that there are some days where my camera dies before I'm ready to leave, right? <laughs> like I just go, I just, I keep them in the That's truck like, and I just keep pulling them You can come to out. Florida, man. You can come visit me. <laughs> I do travel a couple times a year, especially yeah. in the winter months. But yeah. the other thing that you said, um, uh, I rub people the wrong way sometimes. I promise you that if you watch my channel long enough, I will piss you off eventually. But bear with me. Give me another chance. I'm sure that somewhere along the way, I'll do something that'll make it worth your subscription over on the VSO Gun channel. Absolutely. I 100% agree with that. I'm telling you, he's a good dude. I, I wouldn't just tell you that like lightly or whatever. He's a good guy. He's genuinely trying to help people out there and do something positive. So, you know, it's just the way that it is sometimes, man. You can't do this and not go that route, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I'm sure even though like people everyone thinks I'm all nice and everything, which I am most of the time, but I, I guarantee you I rub some people the wrong way as well. So, you know, there you go. All right. So I'm going to wrap this up here at VSO Don't Leave. I'm going to wrap it up. I want to thank everyone that's been watching. Everyone's been commenting, sharing, all that kind of stuff. Even right now, we got a ton of people in here. We have like we're approaching like three and a half hours probably. Lola is like lying down on the floor or something right now. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, I, I really do appreciate everyone watching. Thanks a lot for that. I really do appreciate uh, Curtis coming in and hanging with us for all this time. And I want to thank the people that I was talking about my sponsors. That would be Safety Harbor Firearms, Rand CLP, and Andrew's, uh, Andrew's Custom Leather, as well as Big Daddy Guns that actually gives us the space pays for the the broadband and everything that we're using here and they support what we do so i want to thank those guys as well as everyone that supports us on patreon and that supports the vso gun channel remember it's patreon slash vso gun channel and patreon slash hank strange all right peace <laughs> i'm out of here <laughs>